before we start with public comment, there's a few remarks. First of all, I'll let you know that right after public comment is the budget hearing. And uh, public comment, we have rules that re of decorum that require you to keep your remarks under three minutes. You can speak on any topic that, that moves you. And the council is not allowed, also under the orders of decorum, not to respond. So essentially, <laughs> we listen, but we're not allowed to respond. It's different in the public hearing that will come for the budget. In that case, you're speaking directly on the budget, not about any other topic, but uh, topics related to the budget, in which case you're allowed to speak as long as you want. It seems appropriate. And uh, the council's allowed to respond and correspond. So if you were queuing up to speak in public comment and thought you were just sort of restrained by the three minutes, hold your fire. And, uh, and in a matter of moments after that, you'll be allowed to have a more open conversation about what you're looking for. <coughs> so that said, um, the public comment, as I said, is uh, we ask you to keep your remarks to three minutes or under. I'm sure you have to fill the three minutes if you don't want to. Um, and then uh, we also ask that, um, well, actually, in, on the three-minute rule, the one thing I want you to consider is that it, if you're winding up at three minutes, that's fine. But if you're winding up to s start another paragraph or another thought, that's not fine. I'll ask you to please stop and save it for next time or write it out. And if you refuse to do that, then we will call a recess. The cameras will go off, and we'll wait until you quit the chambers. So uh, <coughs> that said, let's get to it. Um, first up, oh, yes, and I ask as you step up, uh, just repeat your name and your address. Thank you. Anthony Patillo, uh, Autumn Drive, Florence, Massachusetts. Um, I'm here uh, to state my opinion against the override. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about costs and what it's going to cost the average family, et cetera. And all I'd like to state is, is that we've got to look at what the tax rate is going to be. The tax rate right now is $14.26. If the override goes through with the debt exclusions slated from the mayor's uh, notes at being $1.4 million, with new growth being at about $600,000, the tax rate will be somewhere north of fifteen dollars and fifty cents per thousand, and so an average house of three hundred thousand dollars that's about three hundred seventy-five dollars. We're talking families on this, but we're not looking at businesses as well. I just sort of looked at some of the assessor's records for property values on downtown. And downtown, one large building who is valued at four million five hundred dollars, their tax bill is going to go up over. $5,500. It's going to have an effect on small businesses because people that say they don't own property, no problem, well, your rent is going to go up. It's going to cost you more to have that place. The landlord's going to pass that cost along, and they'll probably add a contingency with it. There are a lot of things that are out there that are on that we're going to have to pay for. And again, if you feel comfortable with knowing that we've got stormwater management, knowing that these fees are going to be forever, not, not a three or four year deal, but forever, we'll have added $5,100,000 to our base tax levy that stays there, that we calculate our 2.5% <coughs> override on forever. If you feel comfortable with that, vote yes. But I'm feeling a lot of people are not comfortable with that. Please vote no, but whatever you do, Please respect, hopefully, that you'll go out and vote. This is too important to stay at home and do nothing. This will go on forever. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tone. Um, <laughs> before we get to the next person, um, I've got a notice here that the, we're not actually streaming online now. Is that possible? Do we know anything? So are we or we're not? We're not. We're not online. Okay. But it is being recorded, so. It will be rebroadcast and available on it. Will be on the TV? It, yeah, is it is it playing on air on NCTV? Yes. It is. So it's just not available as an online stream right now. Correct. Got it. Okay. <coughs> um, next up, uh, Charles Coleman. My name is uh, Charles Coleman. 
uh, Acre Brook Drive, Florence, Mass. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, City Council. My name is Charles Coleman. I, re I relive in the Florence section of Mount, uh, Northampton tonight. I am here representing the Veterans Council of Northampton. My purpose here is to provide and give a brief description and invitation to the community on behalf of the Veterans Council of Northampton to join with us for our third annual Flag Day Retirement <laughs> Ceremony on June 9, 2013 in conjunction with the X Lodge 997 located at 17 Spring Street, Florence Mass, time 3 p.m., rain or shine. The ceremony is divided into two phases. Phase one will be conducted by the Elks with a short narration of each flag read by Michael Barsley with assistance from Boy Scout Troop 109 who will represent, who will present the different flags throughout our nation's history. We're past 238 years from the colonial flag to the present day stars and stripes. Phase two will be conducted by the Council, Veterans Council of Northampton with the performance to perform the actual flag retirement ceremony in conjunction with all service organizations supporting all area, Northampton area veterans. American Legion, Disabled American Veterans, Huck Flags 997, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and World War II Association Club of Northampton. In case of inclement weather, the Elks portion of the ceremony will be conducted inside the Elks Lodge. Since the flags are required to be burnt, <coughs> this portion of the ceremony will be conducted at a later time. At the conclusion of the ceremony, light refreshments will be served behind the main tent. Again, the public is cordially invited <coughs> to attend. Thank you for your time and attention. Hope to see you at the flag retirement ceremony. Remember, this Sunday, June 9th, Elk Lodge, 17 Spring Street, Florence, 3 p.m., rain or shine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Edward Judge, is that right? Did I get that right? Yep. Okay. <coughs> Edward Judge, I live on um, Autumn Drive in Florence, and I'm speaking on the two point on the override. I've lived in Northampton for 36 years and have watched the city change, the upgrade of the high school, the fire station, the police station, and all have come into being over the last several years, and they are expensive and paid for with a debt exclusion. But when they're paid for, the taxes will revert back to the baseline values. The permanent 2.5 million increase to our baseline tax levy seems manageable, but with the coming mandatory sewer fee, which will be attached <laughs> to the water bill as well, the average house will see a big increase in what it owes the city. There may be considerably more, well, excuse me, that, was, that should have been edited out. <laughs> And don't, don't forget that the 2.5 million is forever, and the sewer assessment, I believe, will hang for 20 years, which is a long time. Those with fixed incomes who have kept their properties so far may be pushed to the financial brink and lose it. College may become beyond the families with tight budgets. From what I see, the rebates proposed are falling far short of what will save many citizens of marginal means from losing their house. I agree that art, music, sports, and such are important, but should we put somebody out of their home for them? The gentrification of Northampton shouldn't be put on the backs of the poor who have lived and worked in Northampton all their life. Where's the empathy for those who would lose all their memories to someone's well-to-do dollar? Should we really do this to them? Hard decisions have to be made in business and in life in order to keep things under control. When things get better, People can be rehired, programs can be reinstated, contracts renegotiated. But if you lose your house, it's pretty much gone. Uh, I just, my, and finally, I, I just feel we shouldn't put the financial problems we are creating on the backs of the less fortunate. And I think we could do better than that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Judge. Um, <coughs> oh, okay. We're switching out of here. Amy Bookbinder first, right? <coughs> First of all, I, I know some of you know I have an eye disorder, and I hope you'll permit me a few extra seconds to read this if, if I need it. Um, I live on Grove Avenue, but I'm here tonight to discuss the congestion these days at the intersection of classism and racism in this town. First, 
though I want to congratulate the City Council President, not just for your new degree, but because of the meaningful way that you shared it with all in this city. So thank you for that. Uh, before I give a brief up, uh, update on Jonas Korea's case, a few remarks about something I noticed while I was there at the courthouse this morning for his first court appearance. I noticed that on one side of the street next to the courthouse were two benches. Across the benches were metal bars, but there, as I learned recently, uh, which were put there, as I learned recently, to allow people to sit down, but to prevent homeless people from resting there. <coughs> I took a picture of these benches. As I approached the other side of the street, next to the brand new, fancy, expensive police station, all along the street there were shiny new long benches with no bars to interfere with anyone's comfort. I took a picture of that too. But I had to wonder, what are our priorities in this city? Do we, do you as counselors, want to leave a legacy that's a tale of two cities or of a city that comes together united to solve our problems and is welcoming to all? As a member of Justice for Jonas, I joined others this morning in court support of Jonas Correa, a young man of color who was violently arrested by some of our officers <coughs> And as you know, the DA has dropped the criminal charges against him, finding no grounds for them. However, the police are persisting in a case against him. To summarize, he was given an August appearance date for a trial, but, and I've never seen this happen before, the judge admonished the procedure of the police department bringing the case, <coughs> saying he feels uncomfortable because the officers have no legal representation. Apparently, no lawyers anywhere in this city, including our own city solicitor who was asked, are willing to take on this case on behalf of the police. And I think we need to wonder why that <laughs> is. So I join others, uh, including members of Justice for Jonas and um, members of the NAACP in calling for an outside impartial investigation of our police department to, for their benefit and for everyone's. And now as to Benchgate, as it's been called, um, I'm happy to see that the mayor reversed a bad decision. <laughs> I'm sorry. How many more seconds, Amy? There are other people who will probably speak to this point and probably represent the same thing. Well, I was just about to thank you. Oh, well then. <laughs> <laughs> for, and other counselors here, for taking uh, a really strong role in standing up for an inclusive city. And to the council president, a special thank you for joining the disparate angry among us. <laughs> Touche. Anyway, in closing, I want to support um, Councilor Carney's re Carney. resolution. I'm nervous, I'm sorry. And um, I hope we will have more benches. As the mayor said, there's not enough room for people to sit down. And one more thing, if I may, to finish. It's really stretching. Although, although I think it takes some chutzpah to be asking people in the city to have their taxes increased forever, um, and I can barely afford to do that, I am voting yes on the override, and I urge others to do so, because I think it's the right thing to do. And I'm asking you to help design a forum that others will speak to tonight that's open and inclusive and, and addresses all the issues of downtown, because that's also the right thing to do. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susan Lance, please. Hi, I'm Susan Lance. I live at 74 Lime Road, North Hampton, and I seem to have a designation right now of being solar coach for the outstanding program, Solarize Northampton. But in fact, I'm really part of a team of eight plus community volunteers who are dedicated to seeing this program really work for Northampton. And I'm here to really personally extend to each and every one of you and your constituents 
to come to this very important meeting uh, next Thursday at the Senior Center. I, you all have an invite. Uh, it's called Meet the Installer, and our installer is Real Good Solar. And they will outline the program specifics, the cost, and why we are especially excited about this program is that there is an option for those people who might not have five to eight thousand dollars to outlay immediately for solar panels there is an option that you can put nothing down up front and somebody else owns the panels on your roof but yet you can benefit from lower electrical <coughs> cost from what is generated on your roof so there really can be an option for everybody so I really encourage you to get the word out to your constituents and have them come. I'm very excited to tell you that we already have two signed contracts under Solarize Northampton, <coughs> both of them in Florence. I think we're up to 13K now. And so we have to get up to 200 to meet our fifth tier, but we are going to do it. And um, I think the state has put together an excellent program in this. And I'm thrilled that Northampton can be a part of it. It really is a win-win-win situation time in Massachusetts for solar between the federal and the state um, tax credits and then the Massachusetts incentives and then this is just one more layer of reducing the installation cost for solar panels so I think it's something that we can all feel good about and add to uh, what's already been done in Northampton and very green Northampton and help it along for us and for the state so hope to see you all there thank you Thank you. Uh, Vera Dogman, uh, all right, Vera, you're gonna have to help me with your your middle name. This uh, is a Dogmar Martin Cage. Vera Dogmani Cage. All right, we could have stayed here all night. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. From from Amherst, Mass, 12 Long Meadow Drive in Amherst. Um, I'm here speaking as a member of the Justice for Jonas Coalition and. Um, just having attended the court proceedings today, I just wanted to share with you the open invitation to join us on Monday, September 9th, to be there with Jonas's family um, and, and his supporters to see how this human drama will unfold. Um, this is a tragedy that the saga has, has not concluded in a happy ending for, for Jonas at this point, that it, it continues to get dragged on. Um, and, you know, according to Judge Goggins today, you know, he finds the proceedings, the intended proceedings, curious. You know, who's going to prosecute this case now that the district attorney's office is not pursuing the case? Um, so there's a opportunity for a police officer to <coughs> act as an attorney. So, um, like Amy said, the city solicitor, your city solicitor, will not be taking on the role of prosecutor in this case. So what, what does this mean for the city of, of Northampton? Um, and so I, I ask that you participate in the proceedings to observe um, what is happening um, and to say that, you know, there needs to be, as others have called for, an independent review of the police and their actions, um, not just for Jonas, but for future incidences um, that will transpire. You know, when, when the police chief says, we've done an independent review of the internal independent, internal review of the situation and we found our actions not to have violated any um, guidelines, that doesn't sit well with most of us and that doesn't lend into confidence of the police. And you, your body, your, this, this city council, cares about issues of quality of life for folks. And I just want to see that you care about the quality of life for folks like Jonas, um, a person of color um, who has a family and who has kids as well and who also cares about quality of life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Barbara <coughs> Good evening. I'm Barbara Rakaska from Florence Road in Florence. And first, I would like to thank the school committee and the search committee 
for hiring Brian Lombardi as, as the principal at the high school. They promoted him from assistant principal. And this is something that I'd like to see happen in the city more, promoting from within. Instead of looking outside the city for what might be a best candidate, when we have good people here, and the city saw that. I, I have noticed in the past we hire people <coughs> from the outside because they are the best, but it's a stepping stone for them. They stay a couple of years and they leave, and then the city has to pay money to search again to fill that position, where when you hire from within and promote from within, you are getting someone that's vested in the community. And then the teachers, or, or whatever job it is, know they have a stepping stone. So I, want, I really want to thank the school committee and the search committee for doing that. Um, and he is one of the best candidates for the job. On top of that, um, I want to talk about the override. I am pushing to no vote on the override. Um, you talk about structural deficits. Families are feeling the same deficit. Salaries are not rising as fast either. And that means that we have to look for ways to live within our means. Not what we want, but what we need, desperately need. And that might mean <coughs> cutting some things, but that's what we're doing. And I do work for the city and, and I have not, I've seen my pay not go up much, but I've also seen a lot of costs coming back to me that I am not going to be able to afford. Um, they say the average home is valued at 297000 rounded off, um, and an increase of 234000 for the year. What about year two, three, <coughs> and four? And then after that, is there going to be another override? Is this going to happen every four years? Um, I want to reiterate about the renters. I don't think they understand that if their landlords are going to be hit with fees and stuff, their rents are going to go up. And why us? I don't see overrides going in other cities, but are they facing the same cuts as state and federal as everybody? But they manage to live within their means. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, Michael <coughs> Allen, please. My name is Michael K. Helene. I'm an elected trustee of Smith's Vocational High School in Northampton. I came here tonight to report out that uh, the last uh, budget hearing meeting, uh, there was a discussion about our budget in regards to uh, aligning it with the city of Northampton and the mayor's budget. Uh, we heard the council. Uh, the trustees went back and line by line went through our budget and have modified it to meet that 1% uh, savings uh, or amount of $80,431 that was, uh, would be in alignment with what the mayor wanted. And uh, this has been presented as of yesterday. A copy was forwarded to uh, the city council president uh, via Mary uh, Madura and also a copy to Susan Wright, the finance director. The actual budget amendment cannot be voted until next Thursday night when it is our regular meeting. But uh, it is, this has been approved, authorized, and I wanted to uh, come here personally tonight as the trustee to one, to give confidence to the council uh, and Smith's Vocational School, and as my charge of being elected city official to follow that up and make sure that this was handled in a proper manner. And I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. And now your other official duty takes you to the graduation ceremony. Yeah. That's correct. <laughs> Red enjoy, horse. Yes, enjoy that a lot more than this. Problem. Thank you. Uh, Chris Shadoyan, please. Since you said please. <laughs> <laughs> I would try to be courteous. Hi, I'm Chris Shadoyan. I live at Two Graves Avenue. 
uh, and I couldn't be here a couple weeks ago to talk about the city's plan to improve the water drainage uh, from Bridge Street School by adding piping from the school to a storm drain on Graves and more importantly the language of an easement allowing this work uh, because no one on Graves knew about this plan until the day of the council meeting. Um, and that would be understandable except for three things. Uh, one is that the plan to improve the school's drainage has been on the books for four years. <coughs> um, uh, the uh, plan has been actively worked on for the last year by the Department of Public Works. And most surprising of all, we were not made aware of this long existing plan after the residents of Grays voiced so much concern about a completely different not known about an advanced plan involving the same land that we convinced the City Council to table that plan. We weren't told at that point either. And why weren't we made aware of this strange plan by anybody? Why weren't, wasn't the City Council or the City Councilor made aware of this plan? Uh, why not three months ago or when the other plan was tabled? And you know, we just, we just want to be informed. We just want to know. Um, and I, I met yesterday with the mayor and with Councilman Daniels, uh, and I've spoken before to the council about this, and I understand the city can't treat every resident as an individual because you have to deal with tiny side streets like ours and enormous roads like King Street, but I don't think it's too much <coughs> to ask that Graves residents be informed when substantial city plans are going to impact us directly. And you can inform just one of us because we'll all tell all the rest of us. Um, and I think that this easement issue uh, at, at hand, this, which is fairly substantial, is probably going to work out thanks to a lot of people scrambling, a lot of people putting in a lot of extra time and effort. Uh, and that includes city workers whose time ends up badly impacted when things are done this way. Uh, and it doesn't have to be like this. You know, Graves Avenue, Graves Avenue residents go out of our way to work with the city to improve our neighborhood. Uh, Arden, if she's here, oh, she's here, she's <laughs> going to speak uh, a little later about trees um, that we bought and planted for the city um, that will, that some of which will likely be removed when this plan uh, is implemented. Um, we don't really want anything in return and we don't want to stop the city's improvements. We just want to be part of the process. So problems like this drainage and easement issue, which by the way, exists because of <coughs> poorly planned and implemented engineering at the original Bridge Street School basement area uh, can possibly avo be avoided in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Tarantino, please. <coughs> Good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the City Council. With regard to the override, I think there's this mentality about, well, it's $235 for the average person. What's the big deal? That's less than a dollar a day. So I'd like to, for you to look at it the way I look at it. If you leave here this evening and on your way home, you get pulled over by a police officer and you get written a citation for $235, what is your reaction to that going to be? Now that's an amount that you didn't choose and, you know, really it doesn't matter whether you're doing anything wrong or not. What matters is you got 20 days to pay it or your problems are only going to get worse. So. If you somehow have this warm and fuzzy feeling that, well, this, the government needs the money more than I do, and I'm therefore happy to pay the $235 fine, then you miss the point. Because the whole purpose of the government doing that is to punish you. That's a sanction for wrongdoing. That's a penalty and a punishment that you don't do it again. So when it comes to whether you're paying a traffic fine or whether you're paying an increased tax bill, it's still coming from your same account. It's still an amount that you didn't choose. It's really, it is quite a burden. I mean, and for those people who think that, uh, you know, well, the city needs this more than I do. Well, next time you're driving down and you're f driving down the street and you feel guilty that you have money in your account, that the city would rather have, and you'd rather have them spend it because they'll spend it on something more, you know, useful and more efficiently. Then if you see that police officer, why don't you go ahead and deliberately speed up and get pulled over and written the ticket? Because that's certainly an option if you want to transfer your money to the government. And if that seems ridiculous, I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that that makes a lot more sense than voting for the override. Because that ticket is a one-time fee. The override is for the rest of your life, as long as you live in Northampton. Your only way of getting out under the override is by moving out of Northampton or by passing away. In the next 10 years, $235 is going to be $2,350. Now, 
This yes vote is going to cost you, this one vote, one time, is going to end up costing you thousands of dollars, and that's directly. Indirectly, if you appreciate the uh, power of compound interest, that will become the base of whatever other override they want in the next 10 years. This is our chance to really kind of, for all of us, to say what's important. And I think that uh, the city, they really, they want to be first in line. We need the money, whether you need to work on your heating, whether you need to work on your plumbing, that's <laughs> your problem. We need your money first. And I really strongly urge everybody to think about the impact this has on your neighbors and to vote no on the override. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ernie Brill. First, uh, I want to commend the, uh, the City Council for finding money and switching the money from the ambulance fees that was in a kind of a private fund to the general fund. Thank you very much. Sure. It should be. I'd like to commend uh, also Mayor Narkowitz for finding money in some of these very little uh, networks, either old boys or old girls, in the last uh, period that he's been here. But there's still some more money to be found, okay? Let me give you an example. So Smith Folk has a, one superintendent for 450 students. That superintendent makes 125,000. Why is that, okay? We have a superintendent that presides over six schools. That's three teaching jobs, by the way, or one teaching job and two police officer jobs. Plus, in the budget, which I read the other day, there's an appropriation now for $92,000 more dollars for Smith Folk when the receipts are already $5,346,000. <coughs> Why is that $92,000 there? That's two more teaching jobs. So now we have five teaching jobs that we could restore, okay? Um, then there's the Capital Improvement Committee is recommending uh, <coughs> $1,719,000 for buildings, equipment, vehicles, technology. And I keep hearing this, buildings, technology, boathouses, you know. Maybe the Smith Boat Kids could build the boathouse as a project with uh, Jay Wright giving pro bono help, okay? In other words, there's too much money being spent on this town for things that aren't priorities. Now, another one is the park. Uh, I don't know if this capital improvement committee thing is separate from the parking meter revenues, which are estimated on the new budget on page three or four at $1,728,000. And these are paying for police salaries, city official salaries, and um, vehicles, police vehicles. Are these three new SUVs, or are we going to use the same SUVs, or what? Or maybe we're going to use the three SUVs when we cancel the busing for the high school, and the SUVs can make trips to Leeds and Florence Center to bus all the kids to school so they don't not go to school and then drop out. In other words, this budget needs a thorough cleaning and going over, and this city needs to think about buildings, boathouses being more important than the sons and daughters in this city and the teachers who bust our butts and have given back time and time again. And we're not going to get a raise here. That's obvious. We're trying to save our jobs, for Christ's sakes. So I want you to think about that. But in terms of the override, which is for us, I kind of agree with a lot of people are saying, but I would recommend that there be a waiver for low-income and senior citizens and a waiver that people can actually fill out without feeling they're drowned in a barrel of red tape. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Captain Jean LaFrance, please. Good evening. I'm Jean LaFrance from 310 Coles Meadow Road. Years ago, a wise and successful person gave me some advice. Money talks and bovine organic fertilizer walks. <coughs> Since this city's government should not be in the organic fertilizer business, why is it resorting to scare tactics and misrepresentation of the facts regarding its alleged financial crisis and its demand for another $2.5 million proposition two and a half override? Why isn't this city's government being honest and truthful with its 10,682 property owning taxpayers 
It's 19,933 registered voters and it's 23,143 citizens. Over three months ago, this city's government announced a $1.4 million shortfall in its projected 2013 fiscal budget and demanded a Proposition 2.5 override to cover that alleged deficit or it would lay off 25 teachers and five police officers. A month ago, the city upped its demands to $2.5 million Proposition 2.5 override, <coughs> not just for one year, but forever. It now threatens to lay off 10 teachers and five police officers if it doesn't get its demanded $2.5 million a year override forever. Yet while crying poverty and an empty treasury within the last two months, this city's government has spent $484,000 to purchase less than 80 acres of totally worthless wilderness off Coles Meadow Road and has agreed to spend $250,000 to complete a bike path from Leeds to Williamsburg. These two expenditures alone represent at least 15 teacher and police positions. Why isn't this city's government telling its property owning taxpayers <clears throat> and registered voters that the 2013 fiscal budget also includes $1.5 million for the removal of the dam in Leeds. Before that project <laughs> can even begin, again, begin, countless permits will have to be applied for, approved, and received. Not one of those permits has yet to be received by the city's government. If the Leeds dam is not removed during the fiscal next year, the city will not have a $1.4 million shortfall in its operating budget, it will actually have a $100,000 surplus. Two, the city is not telling its taxpayers and general public that the federal government will be refunding $1 million of that Leeds Dam project. In recent years, this city's government has called for more tax overrides than any other city or town in this state. Just two and a half years ago, taxpayers and registered voters granted the city $2 million override for a new police station. For heaven's sakes, that construction project isn't even finished yet, and the city is now demanding another $2.5 million proposition override, not just for one year, but forever. Captain? This uh, you'll, you'll have an opportunity to expand on these comments uh, in just a few minutes as soon as we're done with public comment, but the three minutes has expired, and I, and I appreciate your time, and if you stick around, you could, you could, as I said, you can go on as long as you want, and we'll, and we'll be able to answer, actually. That's another thing that, that'll be different from the public comment section. Uh, can I pay uh, Councillor Tacey a compliment? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, we went over to get me a compliment. We'll go over to get him a compliment, too. I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Tacey for trying to represent his constituency honestly, truthfully, objectively, conservatively. But I feel in this ball game, that man is out in the rough right field all alone. Well, the rest of this government is so far out left, it's beyond that green giant wall in Fenway Park. God bless you, Council Tracy, and God bless what's left of this republic that is the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Arden Pierce, please. Hi, I'm Arden Pierce, and I live at 42 Graves Avenue, so I'm speaking in reference to the easement. Um, and I just wanted to speak specifically about the trees. We did have a meeting with the, um, the lead um, engineer from the DPW and the Central Services Director. And we saw um, maps of their plan. And they said that um, there's a very large canopy of trees right where um, just to the side of, barely to the side of where the drainage would be going in. So there's a lot of, there's 22 adult trees that are at risk in this um, project. 
And according to the plan, there was only, um, I think, around four to six trees that would be coming down. Um, but they couldn't <coughs> say if others would come down or if the others were at risk. So this um, <coughs> canopy of trees really provides a very important environmental factor on this street, and it would be a massive loss to lose as many as 20, the whole canopy. It's quite a bit. So my concern is um, with that, and there's also two trees that are in the median of the, uh, on the street itself um, that are at risk and uh, as well. So this city, th those are city trees that are at risk, and they were purchased by, uh, they were purchased at great expense, and there is no mention um, in our meeting or what we understand about the easement whether the tree, the city trees would be replaced, or um, there was mention of replacing trees within the tree belt that was um, uh, the area that was um, adjacent to the historical society and the parking lot that's one of the abutters of Greens <laughs> Avenue. So um, this is a concern I have, and during the meeting that we had for uh, the walkthrough, the walkthrough with the um, um, with the central service director, he said that there would be somebody present during the project um, <clears throat> to oversee all this digging up in the tree vulnerability. And I just want to be sure that that the, the, that the words that the central services director said, that there in fact there'll be somebody from the city really overseeing, because my understanding is that there people people come from outside uh, the contractors who do all the digging, um, they won't really care about the plans and that more, way more trees may come down than, than what has been stated. So um, that is just the comment I make, that I really hope someone is there from the city supervising this and that I would like to hear more of what, how the trees would be replaced um, that are the city trees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next. Uh, Elizabeth Royalty. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Royalty. I live at 5 King Avenue in Florence. Um, I'm here because on May 8th of this year, the DPW voted not to recommend King Avenue to be accepted as a public street and ordered the Department of Public <coughs> Works to cease snow and ice removal for fiscal year 2014. The residents of King Avenue have been really involved in this from the beginning as soon as we were made aware that the petitions <coughs> had been submitted and that the City Council had referred it over to the Department of Public Works. Mainly we've been really involved <laughs> because we had um, no idea that, that we were at risk of having our public services stopped. For some of us, um, such as my husband and I, when we purchased our property less than five years ago, we had absolutely no idea that this was not a public street. And we, since we've been living there, it has been maintained by the city. And so when we heard that we were at risk of having city services of any kind, whether it be snow and ice removal, and I don't know what would happen with sewer and road maintenance, um, when we heard that those were at risk, we became involved and so we attended the Department of Public Works meeting. I spoke there, but they ultimately voted not to recommend our street to be accepted by City Council. And so we are asking City Council to use its power, which is the only real power in this situation, to just vote to accept our street as a public way. Um, <laughs> as I stated, the city has been providing essential services on our roadway for as long as the residents can remember. Um, it was suggested to us that we form some sort of homeowners association um, for the residents on that street to pay for these services. Uh, this is problematic and I think um, unfair. A, because we did not go into this property purchase thinking that we had to buy into a homeowners association in order to maintain the road that we thought was public. Um, also, <clears throat> uh, we are concerned about the unwillingness of some property owners on the street. Mainly, there are 
are multifamily units that are actually owned by someone who lives in California. Um, so negotiating with them just brings up the practical difficulties residents like us would have of trying to form some enforceable um, homeowners association to maintain the property. So I don't have a lot to say. I did write an eight page memorandum that was attached to some of the materials. I have no idea if anybody tortured themselves in reading it. Um, <laughs> but I, I hope that you at least take a look over it because um, we just want you to realize that there are historical reasons why we are where we are and there are actual practical impacts for the residents of these streets that are really s serious. It may seem small in the context of the entire public, but, but it's really, really large <coughs> to us. Thanks. Thank you very much. Do you have a copy of that you can leave? We, we all have a copy of that. I didn't. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jason Benson, please. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Jason Benson. Also live at 5 King Avenue. I'm going to be talking about the uh, public private way issue, uh, just like my wife. Um, on May 8th, we went to the BPW meeting where you just heard we were rejected for uh, public uh, street status. Um, we went home pretty disappointed, <coughs> not sure how much money this was going to cost us. Um, was getting pretty concerned about it. About 30 minutes later, I received a phone call. It was a, a local volunteer who I happened to know. And she was calling to ask for my support for the override. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty funny. Um, and I said to her, I was planning on it, but I'm not sure how much this is going to be costing me. <coughs> um, and I have a feeling every single person that lives on the private ways that are being rejected right now, they're probably thinking the exact same thing. Um, you know, how much money is the ice and snow removal going to be for me? Um, and with the override on top of that, <laughs> we're talking like, I don't know. I mean, it depends on what road you live on. Uh, for our particular road, I, I haven't even priced it yet. but. Um, so I told her the same situation, and she provided uh, and then, uh, some sympathy. But you know, she was calling for her own purpose, and and uh, <coughs> we received an interesting email the next day. It was actually uh, emailed to uh, Mr. Tacy, and uh, I just wanted to read a couple of the passages from this email. Um, should just take a moment. Um, so in the first paragraph, she states. Uh, some of my Ward 7 neighbors will be shoveling the streets while the city plows will be maintaining the roads on either sides of them. I guess when I want to take a walk down the block on the next snow day that we had better bring our shovels and ice cleats in case our friends are snowed in. The city has acted as though it was a public way by providing snow and ice removal, maintenance and general upkeep for years. I'm not <coughs> sure when this precedent was set Possibly as early as the 1870s, Homestead, uh, when Homestead was developed. I think this is information that would be valuable to know before buying a home <coughs> and setting down roots. The largest financial and psychological investment many people will make in their lives. What if the residents of King Avenue or any of the 50 or so public versus private ways in question are on a fixed income? elderly or otherwise unable to plow or maintain their roads. Many of the streets were never accepted as public ways for unexplained reasons. Would you agree with me that we owe our fellow Ward 7 citizens a better than unexplained reasons? Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. Happens all the time. Um, uh, Ruth Ann Mahoney, please. <coughs> Good evening. I'm here to ask the council to consider naming King Avenue a street. And I have the following to say. <coughs> At the age of nine in 1937, I moved with my family to Myrtle Street, now named Bardwell, to property abutting King Avenue. 
In 1951, my husband and I built a home at the end of King Avenue. Since moving into our home in January of 1952, the city has constructed two roads, with the last one including new sewer and water lines and a new surface sewer. The last road was a major production which included removing and replacing my fence in order to park the heavy equipment on my front lawn. It was a wonderful year for me. <clears throat> when I applied for a permit to build on King Avenue, the city building inspector told me King Avenue was no longer a private way as it had never legally been closed to traffic. It was city owned. As the city continued to construct new roads on the avenue, sweep and plow the street and clean the surface sewers, I think the average home homeowner would have considered the statement to be true. Now a BPW committee of my so-called peers tells me the previous administrators of the city of Northampton have made very poor decisions and we are trying to connect, correct them. Their solution is to correct the supposed poor decisions by previous administrators at the expense of the current taxpayers on King Avenue by denying them the right to be a city street. <coughs> Having paid taxes on this property for 76 years, I find their recommendation is unjust and being critical of previous administrators is certainly not a good image for the city of Northampton. I have, in closing, I have two, one question and one remark. If the city does not own King Avenue, who does? In an article in the Boston Globe that quotes the city solicitor, Mark Rumley of Medford, Mass, as saying, some people will say to you that as an abutter, you own to the middle of the way. Ask them to go to the assessor's office and see if the additional footage into the middle of the street is on their tax bill. I can tell you it is not. So who owns the street? The other comment on in the same thing from the Boston Globe, the only disadvantage to living on a private street here is the condition of the road. It can be poor, and in most cases it has no sidewalk. And if it rains, there are no strong drains. You might want a four-wheel drive if you're living there. This is not true of King Avenue. We are one of the better streets in the city. And I really plead with you to accept this as a city street. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Katie, I can't tell. It looks like you're next, I guess. Uh, Katie Simon, please. Oh, Wayne is? There, there's just some arrows here all over the place, so I'm not sure. Um, my name is Katie Simon. I live in Holyoke, but I lived in Northampton for seven or eight years, and I think that I represent um, a good amount of Northampton constituents, given how many people, hundreds of people, participated on Facebook organizing pages against the bench removal in the past couple weeks. Firstly, I want to thank the City Council for their near unanimous recommendation to the Mayor to restore the benches, um, especially uh, Councillor Carney, Councillor Dwight, and Councillor Adams. <clears throat> this is the second time in four or five years that the Business Improvement District, since its formation in 2009, has taken active steps to try to drive those, ask those people asking for survival money out of town. I was active the first time when during the end of 2008 to inaugurate the formation of the BID, um, it proposed, the people who would then form the BID proposed legislation before City Council that would have de facto criminalized panhandling, despite the fact that asking for survival money is protected free speech ruled to be so on state and federal levels. Only numerous protests and expressions of public outrage managed to shame them into withdrawing this bill from City Council consideration. <coughs> that time, the BID proposed this in spite of both the First and Fourteenth Amendments, which both protect the needy's right to ask for money. This time, the BID urged the mayor to act for them in spite of democratic process 
in spite of concerns um, about the ableist side effects of their decision, which would hurt both the elderly, um, not both, the elderly, um, pregnant mothers, uh, the disabled, and children. Um, they also urged the mayor to act despite the circumvention of democratic process implicit in that action. Um, no, uh, the city council was not consulted, nor were any non-business owning citizens. The BID was so eager in its classist aims that we actually reportedly heard that they hired prison day labor to remove the benches as quickly as possible, not being able to wait for the Department of Public Works to accomplish this task. We should have expected this. After all, the BID lists the classic goal of curbing panhandling on its website in the category of public safety. Who's public safety? Statistically, homeless <coughs> people, vulnerable as they are, are much more likely to be victims of violence, while middle class people are much more likely to be hurt by people they know intimately. Creating violent boogeymen out of the poor is absurd. Yeah, stupid me. We'll give you credit. <laughs> there, Go ahead, you guys. There are already laws against things like harassment. Why do class-specific measures have to be taken? As for the discomfort people report feeling at the very sight of those asking for money in need, the discomfort is a sign of the viewer's humanity, and our response to that should not be to wipe away the sight of those human beings in order to ease people's consciousness and create a more marketable downtown. Okay, I have one more sentence. See, that was another message the BID sent by removing the benches. Don't linger, keep shopping. But we maintain that our public square is not a mall and that it belongs to o not only to consumers but to diverse citizens and community. Oh, sorry, just one more sentence. Um, and given the dearth of shelter space, the average year-long waiting list for public housing, the lack of easy access to free food, um, especially given food not bombs, you know, being driven out of town over the past four years, um, then coming back. The human rights abuse accusations against uh, service organizations like ServiceNet, what exactly do they expect people to do? Thank you very much. Uh, Wayne Stanley, please. Hi, I'm uh, Wayne Stanley. Uh, I was a longtime resident of Northampton, going back to when people used to call it HAMP. Um, I moved out because I was priced out. Um, and I th also want to talk about the, the whole benches issue because I think it, we, we have to go beyond just the re what the removal of the benches was uh, and look at the whole process that was involved, how the decision was made, and the politics behind it. And I think it sets a disturbing precedent. Uh, because as everyone knows, the mayor and some members of the Northampton bid in the Chamber of Commerce got together and decided the bench to go. Katie talked about the reasons why. Uh, and, there, and it was <laughs> overtly stated that the reason was to eliminate or at least curb loitering and panhandling. I think we have to understand, number one, that Northampton is not a mall. It's not private property where the Constitution doesn't apply. The Supreme Court has repeatedly held that public streets, sidewalks, and parks are, in their words, the quintessential public forum. Elected officials, whether the mayor, city council, or anyone who ever sees such areas must not only allow, but must be proactive in assuring free speech for everyone. <coughs> the mayor said in a statement to uh, WWLP that getting rid of the benches was a quick solution to aggressive panhandling. Though this has been recognized, as Katie said, as a form of free speech under both state and federal law. So no matter what you personally think, or anyone personally thinks, about an individual asking for money or maybe Planned Parenthood collecting signatures on the sidewalk, or Oxfam America asking for donations, or socialists selling newspapers on the sidewalk, or a school soccer team fundraising. All these are protected <coughs> legal activities in public spaces. <coughs> and the Northampton bid is just one example of the city government giving private business a special status to administer those public spaces. And I just like got three questions for the mayor and for all elected officials. What other quick solutions would you propose to curtail free speech or any other constitutionally protected activity if you were asked to do so by the private business interests? How much public space is the mayor or any elected official willing to hand over to the control of private business interests? 
And how much public space, which essentially is our space, are we willing to tolerate being privatized and being controlled by unelected, unaccountable, private business interests? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's the end of the people who signed up. Is there someone else who would like to speak? Yes, in the back, and then Marty, you can go afterwards. And then. Hi, my name is Jen Burness Stiles, and I live at 63 Ridgewood Terrace. Um, I came out this evening to express <coughs> my support for the override. As a parent, I have volunteered in numerous classrooms at Jackson Street School, and I've been privileged to observe carefully orchestrated science lessons, skits and plays written and performed by students, and entire classrooms transformed into desert and rainforest habitats. How will teachers conduct such elaborate projects with a significant increase in class size? I've also watched my bright sixth grader, I'm sorry, this is hard for me, continue to be challenged academically and musically at JFK by her talented hybrid Husky team of teachers, as well as Clarion Williams, her extraordinary band director. Ms. Williams' job is on the chopping block unless we can get enough yes votes and that is just unacceptable. Finally, I'm a speech and language pathologist and I've experienced firsthand how well children with special needs can be assisted and accommodated when a school is appropriately staffed. While working for another city, I've also witnessed the needs of students being neglected in schools with high teacher-student ratios. Let's keep the quality of special education services high in Northampton. With special, regular, and music education in mind, I urge you to vote yes on June 25th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marty, you had your end up next, and then Kathy. I just wanted to echo what was just said. This is a very, very hard time for the city because we have been cut from all directions and property tax is not a good way to go. It's a regressive tax. And the complaints that people are giving here tonight, I really, they have to be listened to but our children are our future and we must maintain the public space like people talking about the benches uh, were saying and the major public space that this city is responsible for is the schools that is that is the most important we have to pass this override in order to maintain art music all the things that our, our children need and to maintain proper class sizes and to maintain a police force that defends people, although sometimes the police definitely do make mistakes. Thank you for pushing this. I hope everybody in the city thinks thought very carefully about this and what do, do they want <coughs> Hampton to be in the future? Thanks a lot. Um, yes. Hi, I'm Lily Gave. I own two houses in Center Court, and I'm um, asking to reconsider the uh, notion of allowing a downtown commercial, historic, and unique. Uh, city neighborhood to remain a private way um, in this day and age where it doesn't make any sense. It is a very nice mix of residents and businesses. We have an average of 100 pedestrians using <coughs> center court every day. The condition of the street is an abomination. Um, it was really ironic when I had a uh, fire one of my buildings uh, hit by lightning several years ago that I was mandated by code to make sure that it was accessible in every way, which I was happy to do and thank goodness had the insurance coverage to do. But I just shiver and quake at the <coughs> idea of anybody, even able people, trying to negotiate our street because the conditions are such an abomination. We have no drainage. Uh, the city plowed at whim and uh, mostly myself and uh, Julie Andrus would call and beg them even when they were agreeing to do it. 
um, I was not at the DPW meeting on the 8th of May. I was at the planning board meeting. I thought maybe one of us should show up there and do some listening. And uh, it was very interesting and disappointing because, number one, they were, to a person, um, really aggravated with having even to consider something that they thought was, had nothing to do with their purpose in the city. Um, they also were unbelievably disrespectful and disparaging of Center Court in particular and a lot of the other streets up for consideration. One person said it was nothing but a parking lot, which um, is just not true. Um, we're very, very conscientious about keeping it safe and patrolling, and I myself um, have everybody who has a legitimate parking space have a sticker, and we all are watchdogs for each other. Um, the idea of <coughs> the ID then imposing more uh, money on us is additionally insulting because we get uh, more nothing with nothing for which we pay more. So uh, on behalf of the many pedestrians who have often twisted ankles and um, come into my office with their pants legs soaked up to the knee because of uh, puddles that maybe could become the river sticks. Uh, on behalf of uh, people who do park there legitimately, whose cars suffer a lot of damage because, uh, as I said, there's no drainage, there's no repair. Um, and on behalf of uh, the nature of this unique little downtown community, I ask that you respect uh, its status in 2013 to be a public street. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak? Mr. Cole. Yep. And who else? Sadia in the back. Sadia is in the back. Oh. David Corbett, Fort El Terrace. Uh, you got a lot <coughs> more to look forward to than uh, Proposition Two and a Half override. Stormwater runoff. Yeah, tell me about that. That's been going to be coming up for you. Anyway, oh, congratulations on your certificate. I got mine 40 years ago. But uh, I'm talking about the override. I ran into uh, uh, this woman. I, I won't describe her because it would only be an insult. She insulted me because she said I didn't care about our future generations because I was carrying a no sign, no override. I was carrying it because I worry about housing. What one person pays for a rent for a house for a year in Northampton, just for a, an apartment, it goes for about twelve to fourteen hundred now. Twelve to fourteen hundred dollars. That in a year is half the cost that I paid for my first house back in the seventies. And that was taxes included for a couple of years. I have a neighbor now, there is an absentee uh, landlord, lives in Boston. There is at least four vehicles parked in the street constantly, and then I don't know how many more are associated with it. The reason I can tell that they're there is they're parked in the wrong direction. People on our street now are going over to Lyman Road. They're halfway down. Monroe Street's the next one to get invaded with vehicles from our street because people can't park. This is all associated with rent increases. You know, we worry about the future generations. What are they going to pay for rent? How many jobs do we have in Northampton now that will support a twelve or fourteen hundred dollar a month? You're going to have to talk three, four people living there in one apartment. It's going to be pretty overcrowded, and it's going to get dangerous. You're going to see people in attics. You're going to see people in basements. It's going to be a hell of a hazard. It's not good. You know, narrow-minded Peggy there, she was a yes person. Why don't you think about the whole picture? You know, now you're taking money away from the state. Council Adams wants to keep the money here. What if we all did that? What the hell would we do for the people of Springfield to rebuild? The Boston bombing, who would pay for the 10,000 plus uh, first responders? 
We're going to stop paying the federal government. Who's going to pay for the people out in Oklahoma that are being devastated by tornadoes? You know, this is the United States of America, and we live in a commonwealth. Let's start thinking a little bit. You have preschool in the schools now. A few years ago, you didn't even have full-day kindergarten. Now free full day kindergarten and preschool that is done by lottery. They don't have equal opportunity, these kids. What the hell's going on? Where's that money come from? I know the state just cut out a bunch of money for the schools, for preschool, for early childhood. I understand with the police department, we picked up the Quinn bill when the state said we're not going to give you any more money, which was a good thing, I think. But be honest, forthcoming, and say this is the reason. We have a meals tax that you just did Where the hell did that go? Have a good night. Thank you. <coughs> I really let the camel's nose under the tent with letting one person run <laughs> over, just so, um, and I'm allowing that. But is there someone else who would like to speak? There are a few people. Uh, Dennison, you can go first, and then we'll, we'll move through it. I apologize for extending your night, but there's a couple of things that feel like I don't want to go by. Um, one is, if anybody feels like they had a bad week, I'm a Quaker who works at Smith Vogue. Identify yourself, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Dennison Wolf, 1 Isabella Street. I want to thank uh, the DPW for having the hearing and recommending acceptance of Isabella Street in the middle of the street one morning. That was convenient. And thank you. Um, thanks to uh, Commissioner Freeman Daniels and Commissioner Adams for coming to the uh, dessert potluck last Sunday. Appreciate having you in the neighborhood, Ward 3. Um, thanks, Ms. Carney, Mr. Murphy, and Ms. Labarge for pointing our superintendent in the right direction last week when he wasn't necessarily making himself clear. Um, as a city employee, at least one year, and I think twice, I didn't get my step. That's a permanent tax on my income, not a 2% on my property. So I hope the override passes, and I imagine that it will. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, who's up next? Who would like to speak next? Sit in the back. Yeah. I'm sorry, what's that? So good evening. My name is Sadia Shevin, and I live at 8 Cosmian Avenue in Florence. Um, I'm here tonight to encourage you to give strong support for the public schools in this year's budget. As a sophomore at Northampton High School, I've already been a witness to the effects of the cuts that have been forced upon the school, despite having only been there for two years. Over the past few years, the average class size of the high school has gone from 25 students to um, it's a heading towards 30 students within the next few years. Um, and I was actually speaking to Jen uh, in the back there, um, and her daughter <coughs> is currently in sixth grade at uh, JFK, and for her daughter, this it's very likely if this override doesn't pass and we don't get the funding that she her daughter will be in classes with 30 kids all day. Um, and the problem with that is that it's putting more strain on the teacher to give individual time for each student, but you have more students, so um, it's more difficult to give the help that to each student that he or she needs. And also, the teacher has to spend more time grading work, so there's less diligence towards that. Um, it's just, I've seen what happens to teachers with big classes. It's not a nice thing, and um, I really feel sorry for them. That they're going to that they're facing this, and our teachers are great at really handling this. But I think it's time for no more. Um, also, I personally, I've had last semester, I had two classes that were 25 or more students, and one class that was 32 students actually. Um, and I was speaking with Nancy Athis today, the principal of the high school, and she said said that my English class next year, she already knows that's going to be more than 30 students because all of the uh, AP junior English classes are 30 students, or o over 30 students, and that's what I signed up for. Um, so that's already a definite, and part of that is these budget cuts that we've been facing. Um, so that's before you get to saving the arts. And part of the reason that this problem is la of large classes is getting bigger is that with the arts classes gone, that's actually a good chunk of the um, classes, no matter how large or small they are. Um, you're having, you're getting more students added into the, um, the you, you have more students 
entering into <coughs> the other classes, so that's going to increase class size in general. Um, and also, for me personally, uh, I started taking arts classes this semester. I was a good idea. And I realized how much I really enjoy them. They really allow you, uh, they get, let you be creative, they let you express yourself. And I don't want that to go away suddenly for me. Um, so I'd just like to say this override is very important um, uh, for the high school, for the schools in general. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Going once, or twice. Just uh, submit it to the secretary, <laughs> and it'll be introduced into the public record for the deck. Um, we're going to, I'm going to ask the, um, well, actually, <coughs> okay, so uh, I'm asking the secretary to call a roll to determine quorum. Councilor Adams? Here. Councilor Carney? Present. Councilor White? Here. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Here. Councilor Barge? Present. Councilor Murphy? Here. 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 First up, I'm going to read the published notice. This is under the new charter that we're required to do this. The following public hearing is hereby advertised in accordance with the Charter of Northampton, Massachusetts, Article 7, Finance and Fiscal Procedures, Section 7-4, Action on, op on the Operating Budget, A, a public hearing. By the order of the City Council, public hearing be held on Thursday, June 6, 2013, at 7.05 p.m. We're fudging the time a little bit here. Uh, in the City Council Chambers, located in the Walls J. Pachowski Municipal Building, 212 Main Street, Northampton, Massachusetts, the City Council will <coughs> consider the proposed FY 2014 budget and hear all persons <coughs> who wish to be heard thereon. So, we are convening, <coughs> excuse me, we do have a quorum, we're going to convene this hearing. Uh, the, as I stated before, and I'll repeat, that the public's invited to d discuss items on the budget. Um, I understand things like the benches and things like that are of, of critical importance, but the fact is if we prefer to keep it on the budget. The override is not an unreasonable conversation to be had because it's a prospect, but the fact <coughs> is we're not necessarily in the room to hear, to debate the pros and cons of the of uh, the override between the councillors and the in the in the public. I mean, I'd, I would prefer that we talk about the impacts that the override would have on the budget, one way or the other. So, if if absent the override, which is the current budget that we're discussing, and then if you're inclined, you can also talk about the prospects of the budget as it impacts uh, us going forward if the override does pass. So. Um, what again what I ask you to do is raise your hand <coughs> excuse me and I'll call you and then please identify yourself you may have been identified once already but then and and your address and Jeff you're first and then and Mr. Tarantino you're next so Jeff step on up All right. so what is it I can just kind of ask you guys questions exactly we're now allowed to talk back Woohoo! Uh, right. yes and so you just identify yourself and your Sorry. address please Jeff Massimino 34 Fort Hill Terrace and um one thing I'm kind of curious about, I was reading through the city budget. I haven't had time to read through the whole thing yet, but page four, this is something Ernie Brill touched on, $1,719,749 for high priority investments um, and recommended by committee. And my first question, you know, what committee, <laughs> who's on the committee, what items specifically? And the most important question I would have is, do we really need this stuff or can we get by with the old stuff for a while longer? Um, does, does anyone want to take that in particular? I mean, I don't know if I should. I'd Could you, on page four? Uh, page four. You know, at least it's in the PDF. Of the narrative or the? It'd be on three? All right, because I'm you. getting out of my computer. It might okay. be different yeah. than that. I don't know. Mr. President? Yes. May I recommend that, um, just to keep things flowing, that the presenters put out everything they want to talk about? All at once? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Do you have other? Things you want to touch on too, Jeff? Because I know that this this part is is in, it's. I mean, I'll answer it for oh, the capital yeah. plan, page yep. two hundred one to page uh, two eleven, and and I we have a member who sits on the capital plan here, uh, capital improvements committee that can speak to each issue each issue and each item. But Great. I think it's better if we. Yeah. Oh no, absolutely. For, that's 
So yeah. So going forward, we'll, uh, the preference would be to front load your comments yeah. and questions, and then we'll try to answer them accordingly. So. I guess the only other thing I was noticing, um, I can't remember exactly what part of this is, but the cuts to schools, it doesn't give really any specifics, really. Um, like, what exactly are we proposing to cut? You know, and my suggestion to you guys, me being poor, <laughs> I would think like a poor person. I mean, I'm used to scrimping and saving and going, well, you know, I'd like to buy a new thing here, but I'm gonna put off for a little while because, you know, <laughs> moss flying out of my pockets, I'm broke. And that's just the best thing I can really tell you guys. And I wish I had more than that. I'm gonna try and go through the whole city budget and there's a few of you I wanna sit down with personally. Um, that's pretty much it. I would really scrutinize that 1719749 and ask yourselves, Okay. Well, if uh, if you allow, you were welcome to stay up. Uh, well, I, I don't Council want to Free. take up too much time. Well, no. So. Well, I mean, it's there were questions. They okay. deserve, they had a question mark at the end. So there's. Uh, uh, I know that Council Freeman Daniels wants to speak to it, and Council Schwartz, and possibly Council Murphy. So Council Freeman Daniels first. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is a. Uh, the capital improvement plan is. Um, actually, I, ha I have the page open. It starts on 201, and. Uh, it really is a, uh, it's funded with a sort of a um, hodgepodge of, uh, of, of, of monies. Um, on 202, you see uh, different revolving funds uh, and some old, fun old money that was never used, um, and some free cash, which could be used for any purpose. Um, what I think is uh, telling is that um, it, it, the estimated value of, of all the capital needs that uh, the committee reviewed was 36 million, uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that you know that, that would make a, that would make the city a sort of shiny yeah. new you know Colorado right. city or something like that. But Paved with gold and stuff. Well, <laughs> just at least a level, yes. <laughs> uh, but um, but uh, I, I think that uh, when we, we did pass the capital improvements pr uh, plan earlier this year, um, and again, it, I can't defend. I wasn't on the subcommittee, but what I can say is that it was. It was relatively modest, um, given the, the needs that we have. And I also um, want to, and I, uh, uh, people often think that I'm against the mayor for this or that reason, but really I'm not. I want to applaud the mayor for his um, conservatism regarding the, the capital plan. Uh, he managed to find money in different places that, um, in old accounts and so on. Um, and, you know, some of these you, you might, uh, wonder about particular things. I mean, you, you might wonder about, uh, the, you know, a, a truck or something like that, uh, that the same thing that uh, an earlier person um, commented on. But uh, each of them have their own replacement schedules. So it's right. mostly it, you can sort of, sort of try to keep up with that schedule. And, and uh, I, I know that uh, the other counselors who are so ever on the, the uh, capital improvements um, plan uh, um, committee can can speak more knowledgeably than I can. But I, I do know that uh, this is a pretty modest capital plan. Um, and, uh, and we do try to put money aside for capital improvements every year, even in tight years, so that we don't have these big expenditures hit us, you know, like the bump in the rug, sort of, you don't put, you keep the rug lumpy, <laughs> you know, so it doesn't, you don't get one big bump. Um, Council Schwartz, who are next, if you wanted to, or Council Murphy, I don't know. Well, if, uh, go ahead, Council Schwartz. If you're attending to this issue, then I can attend to the school issue. But. Okay. Well, just uh, I chair capital improvements, and I want you to know there's, this is a very pared down list <laughs> from those that are presented to us. Um, and, and capital improvements is very different from our operating money. This is only to replace facilities and vehicles and things of that nature. And I'm happy to go through some of you, some of these, and let you know why they made it this far from the list. Uh, the parking maintenance department wants to replace a 2003 pickup truck that they plow with, and I mean, 10 years for a truck in this climate with a plow on it is an amazing lifespan. How many miles are on it? Um, I have no, I don't have that information with me here, but I have a plow truck, and. It's amazing that it makes it 10 years. That's a very nasty life for a plow truck. Uh, fire escapes on the Academy of Music. Can't use the building if it doesn't pass fire escape. I've worked there for eight years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was an issue when I was there. <laughs> yeah, it, it has time. been. Um, the high school, since we did the addition, uh, didn't have the fluids in its heating system changed. Uh, it needed its fluids <laughs> changed. Uh, there was a sinkhole Increase. in the parking lot at the high school. We kind of needed to fix that before it started eating cars and students. 
Um, the technology plan, what are computers good for, three to five? We try and replace those on a revolving basis. A roof repair at the Ryan Road School, a boiler at Smith Voke, um, a system to lift ambulances into or people into ambulances on stretchers uh, that helps keep firemen from being out uh, injured on duty from lifting large people into ambulance. It, it definitely pays off. Uh, some of the other things, tactical equipment for the police department, their environmental stuff they keep in their cars has been expired for several years. Um, should they ever need that stuff, you really you feel good as a police officer going into a hazardous material environment, and when you open the package it expired five years ago, you don't feel real good about that. Uh, a handicapped accessible entrance to the Forbes Library. Handicapped people really deserve the right to go into the library, so we need to do that. Do you believe, um, are, is the city matching the money for that, or are they raising it all themselves? Um, I know the when you, when you look at the very front of the capital plan, it talks about its sources. Actually, only $175,000 um, is actually cash in. Uh, there was some free cash left over from the budget last year. <coughs> we'll bond a million dollars of this. 90000 comes from the fire department revolving fund to help with those. Parking receipts um, probably are being used on the parking vehicles and some of the police vehicles. And reprogrammed from completed capital projects, 62000 which would have been from capital projects from, say, the previous year, money that wasn't spent because we were fortunate enough to complete those projects for less than the money we budgeted for them. But please rest assured, the small list of things we actually funded, you know, we funded a million seven out of a $90 million budget. This was stuff, this was the important stuff we really needed to do because it protected buildings, it protected lives. You know, it was things like sinkholes, furnaces, <coughs> roofs. I will make one suggestion. Um, yeah. well, I'm a few things. I'm a mechanic and a computer technician. I also teach math at <coughs> community college. Computers, if you absolutely have to, the biggest thing to replace in them is the hard drive. You can get away with probably a few more years. It's, I don't know what the uh, overall expense on that is, but that's just throwing it, that out. There. It's a, what this was was yeah. a, a contribution to a revolving capital plan, and then they pick and choose which devices in their system are the most antiquated and need to be dealt with. So while we don't know exactly uh, at capital improvements what items they're replacing, we gave them a total amount towards all of the technology in the schools, and then they can pick and choose where they think it's most needed. You know, we don't micromanage to that level. Can I, can I just say, just tag on to the Forbes thing? I, that was a question. Um, that's a question I have as well, actually, and and we're going to hear from Forbes uh, next Tuesday, I believe. So, the, regarding the, uh, the lift. The lift. So I, I'm not sure. I knew it needed to be replaced because it's yeah, shot. So. Um, and may I also, just because I received a, a solicitation yeah. <coughs> from uh, um, a volunteer at Forbes Library, that there is there is an active campaign going on to to fund that project. Yeah, I think they're looking for a thousand already or something like that. Doing pretty well. I don't know what they've raised so far, but they're actively soliciting funds from the general public for that project. Uh, Councilor Schwartz. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to address your question around what exactly are <coughs> will be lost from the schools if the override fails. Um, so first, let me just say that information is publicly available through the school committee, but I'm happy to condense it right here for you. Um, we, it'll be, it's roughly 11 full-time equivalent school staff positions. And what that includes is the reduction of uh, physical education at the elementary level, uh, the elimination of a music teacher and um, cut a reduction of an art teacher at the middle school, which will prevent middle school students from having the opportunity for art and music for all three years at the school. They will not have it for one year. Significant reduction in art, music, theater, and consumer science teaching positions at the high school, resulting in the potential loss of marching band, choral programs, theater productions, and more. The reduction of special education, school psychological services, speech assistance, and other supportive services at every school level. The reduction in textbooks and school supplies, as well as professional development for teacher training at all levels. That's a summary. Again, the very specific point position, you know, the, num the percentage of full-time equivalents lost what you can find. It on the, um... I don't have that. I don't have the budget in front of me. I'm just, I, I just know that it's available. I, mean, I don't have the, the. Like I said, I didn't fully read through it because I'm trying to read through it in PDF on my computer and it's painstakingly <laughs> slow. Um, yep. I also just wanted to say in terms of like, well, can we find, you know, where else could we cut other than that? Like, really, because I, I suspect that few people would argue with the, the value of the things that are being cut. And, um, and what I also wanted to offer to you is the context of over the last 10 years, there's been a total of 37 teaching positions lost in the public schools. There's been elimination of these types of things already throughout the, 
throughout the years, there's already less physical education at the elementary schools. There's already no librarians at the elementary schools, none. There's half as many as there should be at the middle and high schools. There is a zero school supply budget at the elementary school level, zero. They have nothing to get pens, pencils, paper, markers. They need to rely on their PTO or the goodness of their, or going to their own, going to the drugstore at the evening and picking up the supplies. So just to give you an idea of what's, where we're at, and this is why we're at down to cutting the, some core values of our education. There's nothing left to cut but that. Uh, uh, Councilor Spector, I just I, I want to thank you for the directness of your questions, and That's I think okay. overall for for me on this particular this is the third override I think I've been involved in. For the most part, it's been a very civil discussion. I think it's a heated topic for a lot of people, and I think the tone of your questions. I think I'd like to I just like to thank you for it, and so that we can have a discussion about what are the real facts in the bu in the budget and. Flexibility usually works better than hostility. So far, it's panned out that way. Uh, Councillor Labarge would like to say something. <coughs> we'll get to you in a second. Oh my! Yeah. I'm going to be up here forever. <laughs> well, you're very popular. Jeff, I want to thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you for being here, for asking the questions, and I'm hoping, with what you heard, what Councillor Swart has talked about, with the school departments, what has, what's happening here, the capital plan. I think. Councillor David Murphy has explained that very, very well. And also, you wanted to know what page. It's 100. Well, if you really want to get to the nitty gritty on the public schools, it's on page 122. All right, thank you. And oh, I forgot to, I could loan you my budget book until Monday of next week. It's also <laughs> available on the, on the city website, and Councillor Murphy had one. I have a website. Yes, and I actually suggested to, um, yeah. just another quick thing here, I uh, have an e reader. And I tried to put in my e-reader. Most people, I don't know if you guys knew this, with uh, e-readers like the Kindle, I have a Sony, um, Sony e-reader. PDF is horrible to read. My suggestion for you guys, put it in EPUB format. That way it's much easier to download. You can read it on a Kindle. We actually, uh, ironically. I told Jim we, that. We, yes, I know. And yeah. ironically, that would require some capital investment in a machine <laughs> that's allowed to do that. So, I'll uh, donate some of my time. Uh, uh, <laughs> Are there okay. five copies already Council at the library? Uh, we're now <laughs> Donate some of my time. <laughs> What's your number? Uh, <laughs> Council Murphy has one more comment. Oh, just, and, and relative to school budget, um, that's really the purview of the school committee. It, when it goes past us, it's a total number, mm -hmm. and that number goes to the school committee, and, and actually the school committee probably has more direct control over more money in the city budget than we do, because they decide how to spend it and it's probably over 60% of our total budget. <coughs> and it's kind of ironic, and this is just a little commercial for people who are into the schools, I think there's still seats for the school committee that no one has taken out papers for. Only mm -hmm. one person so far as I know has taken out papers for the school committee. Yeah. So um, over 60% of our entire budget is spent by a committee that they're open seats on for a November election. So uh, how that money specifically gets spent is up to the school committee. We see the big number go by but we have no effect over how it gets spent. School committee does. So if, if folks are concerned about it, please consider running for the school committee because it does good and valuable work and it spends a lot more money, I think, than we do. Jeff, I, you, you, you now almost qualify for a stipend for sending up here. Thank you very much for your time and I appreciate that. Uh, Ernie Brill, you're next, if you'd like. And then, oh, I'm sorry, Joe, you know, I didn't see you. You, want, you were next. Come on up, I'm sorry. And then, Ernie, you can come up after him. I guess the whole exercise in fashioning a budget is try to match the uh, income with the outlays. So when looking at the income, I know that uh, the city is pretty diligent about keeping track of tax deficiencies. If somebody has sent a bill and they don't pay it, that isn't forgotten, that's, that's kept track of. So I was curious whether there was an account where uh, excess income that people voluntarily pay over their assessed amount does that happen has it does, is that like just you know something that uh is like you know outlandish so i, I mean that's my question do, do people voluntarily overpay their taxes or do they always pay the minimum they're required to pay so uh council again um, as this is a public hearing i think people can also just speak without yeah without our having to take anything but, uh, or respond or in any way but yeah we do have a fund set up for that so how much money would be in a fund like that 
Oh, um, because that's a gift account, it doesn't actually get put into the budget. So um, as, it, as most gift accounts aren't included in the budget that we pass, so um, they, we don't have access to that, and it's outside of the budget hearing. So, but there is a gift, so I mean. So there is a, yeah, there is a fund, it's tax deductible it's if you wish to, it? and, and it's just not something that we, uh, over, we look over in, this, in the budget. And how much money we, would we be talking about? Uh, you, you're, I mean, like I said, it's not, in, it's not here. Anybody? And it's not anything I know. I guess my question would be then the practicality of, because you were talking about how it becomes acrimonious whether uh, every time there's a two and a half over. And I remember in 2004, it came down to uh, eight votes, no one. And I had written a letter to the Daily Hampshire Gazette suggesting that everybody who voted yes and everybody who put a yard sign that says, yes, I want my taxes higher, declare victory and send in the money that you wanted to pay. And there's this mentality that I'm not going to do that unless the people who disagree with me are forced to do what I want them to do. I mean, if it's a good enough cause, that should be the reason. I mean, it doesn't stop being a good cause, right? If the city needs the money and you think you want to pay the money to the city, um, by my disagreeing with you, why does that dictate what you do? Why, why can't people be encouraged to go ahead and if they want to pay extra, Pay extra, regardless of what so, the override. So I just, I well, it, we uh, do have, a, we do have an account that accepts funds, and uh, I can't say for what people did or didn't do. Um, I'm not sure how this applies to the budget, though. Well, because it's all part of what the money that the city could. So instead of doing it the way we're doing it now, why don't we have something that's voluntary for a change? Instead of requiring somebody to do this and penalizing them if they don't do it. Why don't we, as a community, encourage those community-oriented citizens who think that they can pay the extra amount to go ahead and pay it? And let's see who, so everybody who would vote yes, if they actually had it computed for them on a voluntary line on the assessment when it comes in, this is, you know, the recommended voluntary amount in excess of that. Let's see, as an experiment, how much money that gains. And if that gets us 20% of the way to what the override would bring in, maybe we could, uh, you know, have a smaller override. Well, uh, Joe, I mean, uh, next would be Council Murphy, Council Spector, and just on, on that one point, that's actually illegal. We can't, if there's not an approved tax, we can't assess a tax. So the, that would be the equivalent of assessing a tax. Well, but but it, as, I'm just saying that legally we're precluded from that. Just I'm going to allow uh, Councilor Murphy, then Councilor Spector, and on this side? No, then Councilor Freeman Dean. Uh, people do give us money, but it tends, you know, it's, it's not related to the tax levy. It's related usually to a specific thing. Like Mr. Horner gave us money to paint the homeless shelter, and it was substantial. A council you remember? Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand dollars, but it's usually for a specific purpose, or they don't us <clears throat> donate us land or things of value. But as a gift, we have to vote to accept that gift because it's itemized other than taxes. Um, and I'm supposing we could start a gift account for people who wanted to give us uh, okay. payment in lieu of additional taxes or something. But people do give us money and things of value, but it tends to be for specific things that they want to direct it to rather than to the general fund. I don't recall anyone giving us money directly to the general fund, but they usually give it for a specific project. And as, as in the case of Mr. Horner, it was substantial money, but it was earmarked for a specific thing. And yeah. that also, Councilor, was the second time. And the second time they did that. So. Uh, I was just going to give a, a similar example. The Northampton Education Fund, for example, I believe it has a $1 million endowment so that's been going now for what 10 or 12 years but 20 years now they, they raise money specifically for the schools and have raised a considerable amount so they have a one million dollar endowment that does a lot for the schools but again I, I agree people tend to say okay this is my area of interest um, I want to give some money as you talked about people gave money for planting trees on city streets there's another example and that tends to be what people do so choosing specific areas um, I'm a little concerned that that's how we've had discussions here about people saying we want to put money together to make improvements on a public way. And we've had some discussions about, whoa, do we really want to go down that road? Because then the people on streets where they're very affluent can take care of their streets, but other people can't. I guess what my question is, is the practicality of a new idea of something that's different than has been done in the past, instead of it being an assessment, it is a request for voluntary contribution in excess. You pay your taxes, 
And then if you feel that the government doesn't have enough money and that you have money that you can afford, you, you voluntarily want to give an extra thousand dollars or something like that, that there should be maybe a new approach to have kind of a voluntary override. That people say, hey, this is your assessment, you owe five grand for your yearly thing, but you, you know, you, the, the, uh, uh, instead of an override, you could pay an extra $800 or something like that. And if, yep. so once the money is solicited, if it starts flowing in, it could be put into the budget. Instead of it being for, you know, a specific event, it's for the general fund. I think that a lot of times politicians, you know, I, I remember watching them on TV, they say, well, you didn't vote for me, it's because you didn't ask. Well, why can't the city just for a change ask rather than demand? But, you know? um, Joe, just, so can to, I, just to be clear, this is an ask. It's a, 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 a proposition two and a half is not a decree. So and let me finish, please. Be, and, and to the larger question, you, you're speaking philosophically and you've spoken in the past philosophically about the, the propriety of taxation or the way of the system that we do taxes. And uh, I think there's room for plenty of room for discussion for that. You and I have, we agree on some points, in fact, actually. In other points, I, we, we stray apart. But the point is, and my concern is, is that we're talking about the budget that we have before us. So I want to <coughs> keep the conversation focused on those points because the points you're making right, relative to responsibility, who should be accrued taxes, or I mean, why we should accrue taxes, when is it appropriate to tax and not, that um, on some level that horse left the barn. The, the Proposition 2 and a half is essentially an appeal to the community to, to ask the community, which we are required by law, whether they feel that we're too, we need more, whether they agree that we need more money to do the services that they want or not, or whether they can afford it. And, and, and then it's up to the opposing parties to make their persuasive case, at, civilly, hopefully, and then the public ultimately decides. So <coughs> the, so what I would prefer is if we could keep to the points of the existing budget that we have before us, because that's essentially the purpose of this hearing, is to, to address the issues of, of the, the current budget that, the, that is being proposed that, the, that we're going to be required to live under. I, I appreciate that, and I certainly want to be uh, you know, a uh, positive uh, participant in any kind of you discussion about that. I'd just like to ask one more ask one more philosophical point that would go into this budgeting process that uh, let's say hypothetically you're a vegetarian and everybody in Northampton votes that you have to eat chicken tonight for dinner okay now is that going to be well it's the will of the majority that's democracy or is that going to be the reason we have a Bill of Rights because that's you me saying no I don't want my taxes raised <coughs> somehow isn't, doesn't become voluntary because everybody else thinks my taxes should be raised, especially if they themselves aren't paying taxes to the extent I am. So, the, so I think that for you know, the idea that, that people can come together on what we agree with is that uh, for me, I don't have kids in school. So when somebody tells me that, uh, well, their kid needs ban you know, a band uniform, do I have to buy the kids <coughs> blue jeans too? Do I have to buy him his birthday presents? He's your kid. You take care of him. Why do I? Why am I forced to take care of somebody's well, band uniform? That's, can to I, that point, can that's I, kind of where we part ways. But uh, Congressman Freeman Daniels. So, then so you're, Adams. you know, the I would be. I'm very much in favor, and we do have a gift account that will receive voluntary contributions for for any purpose uh, from <coughs> um, from uh, citizens. And actually, we don't have to. Uh, we don't even have to vote to accept them. Uh, we have to vote to expend them, but not to accept them. So this is so part of the, the contributions that we receive. We actually sometimes we it's a surprise when we see them built up in our account. So that's so that your your question germane to the budget really uh, is is that sometimes those do get spent on on um, uh, uh, things that the city needs or or things that uh, the city has put as lower priorities. Typically, typically lower lower priorities. Um, the second part is the ph philosophical questions. Um, I was a, I, I, um, I majored in philosophy in school, um, and obviously I, I don't think that anyone who has a, um, an issue with the eating meat would be ever compelled to, be, to eat meat because uh, the community voted that they should um, or that they would have to, <coughs> uh, that they would be protected 
um, because it would be a, it would be personal preference. But uh, taxes aren't the same as personal preferences. This let me finish. Taxes aren't the same as personal preferences. Number one, and also in fact, when you when people go into the ballot box, this is I talked about this last time. When people go into the ballot box and vote for an override uh, or against an override, they're not voting to tax particular people. They're not voting to tax particular people. They're not voting to raise their own taxes. They're voting to collect revenue. They may be, if they're renters, they may be the future homeowners of a particular place or of a particular parcel. They may be the, the, ne the next person who gets taxed, or they might be someone who's currently taxed, they have their parcel taxed, and they may be selling it the next day. They're not voting to, <coughs> to, to tax particular people. They're voting for, to raise revenue in a particular way. There's a difference, but I've already, th I, I don't want to get into a philosophical debate about the fairness of an over of our override system, which I think is probably the mo one of the most fair systems we have in, in the nation when it comes to raising taxes. You don't see it on the state level uh, very much. You see it a little bit in California uh, and other state and a few other states. You don't see it on the federal level. You see it on the local level because we can be responsive to citizens' concerns and citizens' needs. That's where you see it, and you don't even see it in most states. You see it here. It's one of the fairest ways we have. I don't think, and I, I really don't think that uh, we should be talking about the, the fairness of an override because it is very fair, number one. Number two, I'm glad you brought up the override um, because I, I was hoping that the mayor would um, would be, be able to present his plan, and I'm, I'm saying this now to the to the council and also to the to the administration, <coughs> to present his plan f for what cuts uh, would be restored, what cuts that are currently in this budget would be restored, should the override pass. Um, in fact, I, I understand that um, there's probably an extra maybe two or three hundred thousand dollars at minimum. Um, that are um, that is the difference between our deficit and what the mayor intends to spend uh, at the on the upcoming fiscal year, and I'd like to see where those uh, where that that might happen uh, before June 25th. Um, I was hoping that uh, we would get that uh, <coughs> soon. Uh, we have another meeting before June 25th, I'm, and I, I would really like uh, if I don't think the mayor is here tonight. Well, no, he, the mayor the mayor is at the commencement at Smith Okay. Okay. Well, um, that's he's that's also time well spent, but. Uh, I do think that uh, we really should see, the council really should see uh, what the override, um, and I said this when we voted for the override as well, that really during the budget process, I, I would really like to know uh, what cuts, what, what, how this budget will change uh, if the override does pass. Because this is what, if the override does not pass, this is what, we're, this is what we have. Okay, and you, you see the you can see the litany of cuts to the schools on page 125, I believe, and you uh, 120, yeah 125. You can see the other cuts and services during our pu our public hearings. For instance, we're not going to get p police officers walking the down the streets of downtown Northampton anymore. We're not going to be able to uh, cover have them on foot because they need to be able to <coughs> cover a wider area. They're going to need to be in, in vehicles. Those, those, are, those are the cuts that we see. If we have an override, I'd like to see what cuts won't happen and what the budget changes look like. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Adams, Councilor Pace, did you have? Okay, and then Councilor Pace. I was just going to speak to how fair and democratic the override process is, but Councilor Freeman Daniels um, adequately articulated that, so I'll wave my point. Councilor Pace. We do vote to accept the gift, don't we? Yes. We vote for the use of them. I know, and we vote to expend them. We also vote to accept them. Yeah, I think so. I think just a point of I'm just curious. Um, uh, okay. Tangible gifts, yes, but intangible things like cash, no, just an expenditure. Donation of a bike rack, for instance, we do vote to accept. Uh, the donation of cash. We voted to accept cash on several occasions, checks that would come in. Yeah, but anyway, and remember uh, Mr. Fred Ames, teacher, he died, he left two and a half million dollars to the school. Um, so. Uh, but I have a letter off to the Department of Revenue that is asking if, uh, which I think would help a lot of people uh, on their taxes, to um, exempt, as we exempt CPA on an override for a piece of property. I don't know how it's going to come back. Uh, they usually respond within three or four days. Um, 
if you are of a certain dollar amount in your household number of people. And I've asked the, I've asked the Department of Revenue to weigh in. Um, uh, Don Gorton is uh, their name, so we'll find out. Um, and I, he's been he's been good to us before. Could you so. clarify what it is you're asking the DOR for? Yeah, on the, on the override. So we have abatements from uh, the assessor's office, and they're actually quite lame if you if you think of it. Um, they're money that you can you know um, you can defer a certain dollar amount or a percentage of your taxes, but you have to pay it back <laughs> at five percent interest. And there's another one that is if you're 70, uh, you get um, 200 or 450 dollars uh, off of your taxes. Uh, but most of those most of those exemptions they're they're, they're still they're, they're already getting them. So so it's it's just a question I asked the Department of Revenue, and um, we'll, we'll see what they how they respond. I don't know how they will respond. I have no idea. So uh, you saw before. Well, I, yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate your indulgence. It's my I, from what you've said, it sounds to me that these gifts are. The people take the initiative themselves. They're not solicitations or requests by the city or by anybody else. It's just somebody, hey, I want to help the city by leaving this property or something like that. And what I'm asking is the feasibility of doing something different than has been done in the past, which would be instead of saying, well, instead of owing $5,000 this year, because 50 plus 1 percent of the uh, public had voted to increase everybody's taxes <coughs> that uh, well, you know, it's either going to win or it's going to be, you're going to have winners and losers. And what I'm saying is if there are people who are inclined to pay higher taxes and vote yes and lose, that that can still be a resource that's tapped into if they're just asked. If, they, if next year's uh, tax bills go out with the required amount and an additional 2.5% or 3% or whatever the city council thought would be wise for everybody, if they if they refuse to pay more, then that's their freedom. So, and Joe, if I may say, um, uh, we've heard your suggestion. The problem is, is we don't know even if legally, because the form of an ask confers a certain authority, and so my concern is, and we'll check and see if that's feasible. We can investigate that as a possibility, but the um, to the extent where you ask, we basically need. The authority to do that, a proposition two and a half, for instance, override the voters of conferring the authority onto to the body. But if you know, it's worth investigating your proposal. So, and and I've heard it. I understand what you're asking. You're you're saying to the people who who would support an override if they'd be willing to, uh, it, despite the override failing, if it should fail, that they would continue to their commitment that they originally expressed. Well, and I would think that Northampton would distinguish itself among its peers by it's saying, point hey. Water, this, point of order here. You know, this is supposed to be a public discussion. This guy's been up, it's been half an hour now. It's, and, and I don't really think it's fair for the rest of us. The rest of you, everyone, will have an opportunity to be heard. Okay? So, and if it's any it consolation, it's, all night. <laughs> it's, 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 everyone will have an opportunity to be heard and we will hear them. I mean, I would be sitting at home minding my own business if the city weren't after more of my money. This is why I'm here. I'm not here because this is pleasant for me. I don't have something better to do. It's like contesting that speeding ticket for two hundred and thirty-five dollars. That's real money for some of us who have to but borrow money to pay Mr. our Chair. taxes. I, and, that, and, and now you're repeating yourself. So we, and we have heard you. So I appreciate okay. that. Thank you for your time. All right, I appreciate Thank your you. Thank you, Ernie. You're next. Thank you. um, I want to thank Mr. Moore for the clarifying <coughs> capital improvement plan. If you could just identify yourself for the Ernie secretary. Brill, Seven Laurel Park. Um, I just want to briefly say that um, this parking meter fund revenues, that's different from the capital improvement plan, am I correct? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Within this, because there's one little piece I disagree with you, that any money for the schools should be sent to the school committee. First of all, <coughs> this year the city council has met with the school committee. We've had some joint meetings. Is that not right? Okay. The other thing is, there is a general fund for the city, and the money can be given to any department <coughs> in the city. That's what we talked about with the uh, firefighters' ambulance fees. Is that correct? Okay. So therefore, I don't see why money can't be given to the schools to fix what's insanely, horrendously messed up with, our, with the school budget. Now, one of these things is I've been talking to people for years. They say, you know what? 
and these people from both sides, town and gown in hand, they say, how come the police department every year gets three new vehicles? And some people say, how come the chief gets, you know, takes it home and all this? You know, okay, so these are, th you know, axes to grind, who knows, you know. But I have seen the three new SUVs that were purchased this year, and I have personally asked two officers at least, how much did these babies cost? And they wouldn't tell me. And in fact, they seemed embarrassed to tell me. But I asked my class, since I don't know much about cars, uh, how much do you think those SUVs cost? They said 50000 easy, okay? That's $150,000. That is three teachers and maybe an ESP. That's the salary, okay, of those people. So why each year do you need three vehicles? Why can't you just go to Nicky D's? He's reliable. And you know, then, they, then there'd be plain, plain clothes cars, and maybe you could drive around and catch some of the drug dealers <coughs> sit on those benches too, and sell drugs to our students, okay? But apart from that, apart from that, so I'm saying this money can be switched, I believe. That's one point. But the main point I wanna make about the cuts to the schools that maybe a lot of people don't understand, but I just am about to retire from 22 years teaching at HAMP, that this is the deal. There is gonna be one art teacher, Lisa Leary, and our, depart our art department has produced some of the highest quality work and awards in the state of Massachusetts, even with the private schools. We win awards every year. Our kids go to the best art schools and our kids have played in Annapolis in the Navy Band on invitation, okay? That's the kind of art and music program we have, the best in the state, okay? And now you're gonna reduce that to one teacher after whittling down. When I came there, there were three full-time art teachers, okay? And the more important point is there are kids who come to HAMP every day, and they're there for the art, and they're there for the music, and who knows what would happen to them if those programs were cut. I would say some of them would potentially leave and drop out, and you'd find them in Pulaski Park or on the benches two years from now, okay? What concerns me even more is, okay, you're gonna cut the buses, okay? Well, that's cool for the parents who work at home or have money or can drive their kid to school, but a lot of parents in this town don't, okay? They don't work at home. They go to work every day you know, eight to five, nine to, whatever. So how are you gonna get, how are these gonna kids gonna get from Florence Heights and Ryan Road and all the way by East Hampton and from Leeds to school? We're gonna have the strongest legs in the state of Massachusetts. And winter, okay, they'll just become great skiers, okay? Is that what's gonna happen? How are they gonna get there? You are gonna increase the dropout rate, I can guarantee it as a long-term teacher, because people are gonna get discouraged. And as far as the 30 kids in the classroom, hey, I've been doing some of that for the last five years. But let me just tell you the one other piece that the city council really needs to worry about. What nobody talks about, because it's a two-school system, and all the attention and the money goes to the top, the AP classes, you also have a lot of kids who are, quote, sped kids, and they have IEPs. And their IEPs say that they are to have help one-on-one -on -one and somebody in the class or someone in the classroom to work with them. These are a lot of the positions that are being cut K to 12. All these dedicated teachers, they don't have the degree, maybe or they're getting their degree, who work with our kids. And I had a class of 28 kids and I had no help and half of those kids in my class had IEPs. And Heather Brown, another teacher, same thing. And when she went to the administration, said, I need help. She said, sorry, we don't have enough. <coughs> Just do the best you can. Now, I'm saying, okay, play the fiddle, but there's something more important here. An IEP is federally mandated. It is a law that these kids get whatever is on their IEP. And if you don't follow that, you're open for a lawsuit, and this city will lose a lawsuit like that. And then you think we're in the hole now? Because I saw this happen in New York City when a school wasn't compliant. 
and they were sued for two million dollars <laughs> they lost that suit okay and they were up the creek not to mention the damage you're doing to all these kids okay so that is something to seriously consider and if you have to take money even just to restore the ESP positions I would strongly advise that you do that that we do that okay and as far as the comment gentlemen okay I understand that some people say okay I don't have a kid you know my kids are old I don't need any but what, what happened to that famous saying it takes a whole village to raise a kid what happened to that thing about community Northampton is a community and these kids may someday be the uh, nurses or doctors or He's at Save Your Life. Just keep your comments <coughs> directed up here, please. And then right. um, if. So, my I'm question sorry. is why can't money be transferred? Um, Council Murphy. Um, relative to the capital plan, the capital plan money is in addition to the budget. No, I'm not talking about, so, talking about parking. Parking. Oh, parking. Let's whatever. look at that. Parking is in, parking, some of that one's up in the general fund. But money that is that the capital plan, which is money from outside the school department budget this year, that we're going to spend is fifty-nine thousand dollars for the heating system at the high school, fifty-five thousand dollars for that lovely sinkhole in your parking lot, a hundred thousand dollars for the technology plan for the school department, one hundred and fifty thousand for the roof at Ryan Road School, and one hundred and fifty thousand also for Smith Volk, which we consider to be education dollars. So that's money that's not in your budget or Smith Volk's budget, but that we send up there. Yeah, and that's then, great. and also, there's any number of dollars that go to the school department that are on our side um, of the budget, substantial amount of money that's on our side of the budget for retirement funds and things of that nature. So it isn't just money that's in the school department budget, it's capital money and also benefit money that's carried on our side of the budget. Yeah, well, that's what I'm trying to get uh, clarity on. Yeah. Councilor Spector, then Councilor Freeman Daniels. Uh, Mr. Brill, thank you. Thank you for teaching at the school. I had two daughters who were in your class, and they both loved your teaching. <coughs> um, and you're a dedicated teacher, and I agree with most of your comments on the school piece. I just can't let you sit down, though, on one comment you made in public session, so you know this. You talked about a boathouse and money going to a boathouse, so that's very specific. That is not in the budget. We're not funding a boathouse. Is that so. community preservation? No, nope. no, there's no money. There's no money for boathouse. So. No boathouse. And also, and I'm not sure you said this, but just to clarify, but I can understand the misunderstanding on that. And also the misunderstanding on things like that when we do, you see the city put forward 400000 and we bought a piece of land. We learned last at the uh, budget hearing, I think it was very interesting, the planning department actually takes in, I forgot whether it was four times or five times as much money. Do you remember the figure? Yeah. Ten. Ten times as much money through grant, which are what primarily are funding these. So I'm not sure if you made the comment, but whoever did, that that money that we're using for some of these projects, we're actually, we put out the initial money, but we're getting all of that money back. And it's a, it, for every penny they spend, we're getting 10 cents back on that. So no, it's, that's about land. I understand. okay. But well, that's also, just so we're clear, it's not money that, it's, it's a dedicated line item. It's not money that can be reinvested at our whim. It doesn't go into the general fund. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Um, thank you, Mr. Brill, for your comments. I, uh, and, and thank you for teaching at the high school and, and for, for doing the extracurricular activities at the high school that I benefited from so much. Um, I, uh, I do want to um, pick up on the, I, 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 there's not much else I can say other than, uh, especially regarding the school, is that I completely agree with you. Um, <coughs> The budgetary um, assignments are the purview of the mayor. Uh, we can cut, but we can't re. We can't increase any department's budget. It's simply not in our in our power. Uh, we could cut, for instance, from a particular um, item and recommend that it get added, uh, but um, the council does not have the ability to to increase funding okay, the, mayor the mayor yeah and um i'm i'm also happy that the uh, boathouse br was brought up because it was it was really um it was a lot of sizzle uh but uh, not much stake uh, in in the um in the newspaper um just the other day because it it was really it's a great way to sell uh, a wonderful uh, asset that northampton might have in the future uh, but uh, there's no 
allocation for a boathouse. Uh, and and I, I can't say this, uh, President Dwight's been saying this, we've been assuring Councillor Tacey of this, uh, <laughs> and I hope that the, that the, <coughs> the community at large gets this, that we are not spending general fund dollars on a boathouse. Uh, I, I don't know, I don't even think that the majority of the councillors would support that, even though I, it, it, it will probably be a wonderful thing. I, I don't think that we would ever send the money to a, 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 uh, a boathouse, despite how probably how wonderful it would be to be able to recreate on the river uh, instead of um, funneling it to, to, our, to our schools. There you go. Um, and the, the, um, the last part about the, the um, parking, the parking um, receipts, those can be used for any municipal purpose. Uh, but they, the, be, the sort of best practice for the city and for many cities, and this is sort of prescri this is prescribed by the um, by uh, best practices when it comes to <coughs> managing business districts and, and managing downtowns, is that you want to try to uh, recycle m much of the of the parking receipts that are collected back into downtown services, whether they be um, whether they be uh, p police cars or or um, <coughs> or uh, certification <laughs> or infrastructure projects, uh, it's typically considered a, b a very good practice, in fact, a best practice to, um, to recycle the, the, the basically the, the, the um, fees collected f in parking back into downtown infrastructure uh, or wherever it is that you're collecting. Uh, Let me collecting ask you a parking. quick question. I'm taking this from David's letter. It's on, you know, on page five. I don't have the whole budget with me, but so instead of the three police cruisers, why wouldn't why can you talk with Mayor Narkowitz about using that money for the three foot offices that we're going to need if the override fails? Isn't it better to have three people than three cars? Does Maybe have somebody loan us three horses. <laughs> it was a long standing practice in the city of Northampton to utilize parking receipts reserved for appropriation strictly for parking related purposes. I didn't read it that way. <laughs> so that was the that was what made me contact against three or four department heads, a mayor, two city solicitors and two finance directors. They said that that money had to be used for parking related purposes. So I went to the Department of Revenue and I came back with a letter that said Parking receipts reserved for appropriation can be used for any lawful municipal expense. And it was exactly around this argument about the schools. It, in my eyes, it freed up a lot of money mm -hmm. that we were utilizing yeah. for things. You remember the bucket loaders. You remember all the big, well, anyway, there is, and that was, the, that was why I went after it, because it seemed to, it was a huge pot of money, and now it's going to be one point seven or whatever million dollars again uh, so that came back also receipts reserved for appropriation from ambulance receipts reserved for appropriation is covered in the same general law uh, on municipal finance and taxation it can all be used it says we won't get into the law of it but it, it can all be used for any lawful municipal expense so there is there is absolutely no reason whatsoever it just depends on how the mayor proposes the budget. The mayor could take $200,000 out of the parking receipts and ship it to the school. That's, it, that's, his, that's, that's up to the mayor. And as far as the, as Mr. Uh, Councilor Daniels brought it up, the boathouse, my opposition to the boathouse, and I've said this a million times, but everybody wants to twist it, is the grant money. We need to look at grant money. I would much rather have the feds and the states through legislation change how they administer grant money, maybe administer not quite so much grant money, and give that money to cities and towns as unrestricted local aid and let us utilize it where we see fit. But nobody wants to get their hands dirty and go after it. I do not believe that all of this grant money 
has to go, has to have all of these, all of our tax dollars. I'll not say <coughs> grant money, I'll say tax dollars. I don't believe that all of these tax dollars have to come to the city of Northampton with all of these strings attached. Never mind the baloney. We used to get 1.7% of our entire city budget from the federal government. We're now down to 0.3% in just seven years. Look at where the state has cut us. But they continue to administer grant money by leaps and bounds. Owen Freeman just said we get 10 times the amount of money in grants through the planning department. For Christ's sakes, let's have it as unrestricted local aid and we can fund our schools. We're going to do $38 million worth of road work. Go ahead. It's all about the budget. Can, you you can guys can't do that. Doesn't people like, three people like Peter Kokot have to do that? Well, can I respond? Yeah, in, 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 point, in point of fact, legislation. in point of fact, actually, I think that was the gist of the argument. And again, it's a larger philosophical argument about taxation. And in fact, I don't think there's anyone who would argue Councilor Tacey's point. Well, can, that, I, can I respond to that? Because he was directed it. And sure. Yes, you may. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, actually, I just wanted to respond because uh, I just wanted to point out that the city's uh, exa another example of the city's wastefulness is this uh, is the bike path extension, which I, I think is is in your <coughs> is in your work, Council Tacey, and and uh, that is also a grant. The city would not opt to spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars from the general fund to extend a bike path. As much as the bike path is a good thing, we would not decide to do that with our general fund money. We would funnel that toward schools or other infrastructure projects. Um, that's all. That's all, all if you so. if you what I was going to say was that. Um, the frustration that's born here in the council floor that you're seeing manifest here comes from essentially a profoundly dysfunctional way, that w the way we ask for the community to subsidize the community. Once upon a time, as Councilor Tacey said, once upon a time we collected income tax. It was, based, it was a progressive tax focusing on a person's ability to pay. And in the <coughs> interest of politicians a little further away with more expensive suits, we're starting to make decisions that were expedient at the time. They decided that we're cut income taxes because we're not getting business investment and so on and so forth. But the fact is that the services are still mandated, as Councilor Tacey points out, and as, as Councilor Freeman Daniels said, these are mandated. And so what they do, what they've done instead, is they've jerry-rigged the system to the point where it is a very awkward and clumsy and intrinsically unfair contraption. And so philosophically, you're not going to find an argument on this floor ever on these points about about distorted priorities and how we invest in our priorities. Unfortunately, the the job we signed up for that pays very little is it requires us to uh, we're dealt a hand of three cards when the opponent has seven and we have to play those three cards. We don't get to fold, we don't get to back out, we don't get to do anything else. And the fact is I absolutely agree. We are stuck with a regressive tax system that requires the homeowner or the property owner, not necessarily based on their ability to pay, someone who paid down a $60,000 mortgage years ago is now paying more in taxes than they were paying on their mortgage, and they're on a fixed income. And we are creating an enormous disparity in, in the community by basically forcing those people to sell an asset and leave town. It is excruciating. The fact is, is that we, Proposition 2 and a half as a mechanism actually is, as Councilor Freeman Daniels said, a, a pretty interesting uh, contraption that actually makes sense because what, to some degree what it requires us to do, they set it at 2.5% increase annually, which is never going to jive with inflation. Inflation's never been 2.5% on average, and they knew that. What it was going to do was going to compel the, the city governance to appeal to the community every single time that they needed to increase those rates and find out what the community sense of priority were. Are they to subsidize the schools? Are they to subsidize safety? Are they to subsidize streets and roads? And as the state and federal government has continued to abdicate their, their commitment and devotion to that, it falls on us. And then we have stormwater management fees that we have to do. We have a CPA. We come up with little, we come up with a CPA tax. We come up with a bid tax. These are special little devices that the state uh, uh, basically gives us as a gift in their mind that they're giving us the opportunity because we are only we're very limited as to how we can generate revenue in this community um, maybe that's good maybe that's bad but the fact is is that it, it really does render us and puts us in the position that we are every year is to having the discussion about priorities and a budget is a document that supposedly reflects a community's priorities 
and 62 percent of our budget is devoted to education. And I think we say pretty loudly to the world at large, we are devoted and committed to education. It's that we're willing to invest close to 62 percent of our budget to that end. And it's still not enough. I would never make the case to you that it's enough. It's not even close to enough. But that, I mean, that is the large, and I'm sorry, that was the larger philosophical discussion, but I just, I think it helps frame the context in which we're having these discussions. And, and the, when there, we're expending, extending the bike path or <coughs> creating a riverfront park, that's actually us taking advantage of the little money that we can take advantage of in the form of grants, but it's dedicated. And we can't apply that to a school. When we're extending the bike path, we can't take that money. We say we would much prefer to invest in our teachers than we would to put down <coughs> a gravel path for a bike path. And, and I think t uh, Councilor Tacey's point is absolutely valid in that respect. We would love to have unencumbered funds coming back from the state, which is our due because we already invested in this. This is our money. We're asking for it back. But it's coming back in smaller and smaller bits and pieces and with more and more strings, on top of which lots more mandates is what we have to do. I'm done. Councilor Carney, then Councilor Tacey. Thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you, Mr. Brill, for your comments. Um, and the previous gentleman who came up and spoke, I think we've, we've heard from two of the general public yes. so far in, the, in this uh, hearing. So I, I guess um, well, I'm, I'm interested in the process here. Um, this is the mayor's budget that was presented to us as a city council. As uh, Councilor Freeman <laughs> Daniels pointed out, mm -hmm. what, what the city of Northampton charter allows is for this body to cut the budget. We are allowed to look at um, <clears throat> depart either departmentally or um, across the board. We are allowed to make cuts. And I think that you've offered a couple of places that you suggest that we might cut. One being, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, uh, purchase, per, uh, the purchase of, uh, of police vehicles. Three, three vehicles, I think you suggested. And SUV vehicles. <clears throat> three, three of the police vehicles. I don't think they uh, make the Crown Victoria anymore, which used to be the standard. <coughs> um, so uh, I, I think we hear that. Um, again, <coughs> to reiterate what Councilor Freeman Daniels said, we cannot order the mayor to then take, take that savings of $150,000 and direct it to, um, to the schools. And so I think I'm not sure that there would be the will on this body to ask to, to make that cut, to cut those three vehicles or to cut that dollar amount out of the police budget. And in fact, you know, my read of the budget, you know, is, is, is one that looks at uh, this is a really conservative budget. It, it, it will have the cuts that that will be made if there is no prop two and a half override. And um, as other councillors have said, I do have the confidence that this mayor and finance director have gone through with a with a fine tooth comb any place that there may be savings at all. And the frustration is that there really is not enough <coughs> revenue. There really is not enough money to pay for the services that we essentially we really desperately need in the city. So um, I certainly am not prepared to um, to vote tonight to cut the uh, police department budget by $150,000. I'm not sure that I heard any other recommendations for cuts, but well, again, that's what uh, we can do. Use the ambulance as well, but. The, no, the 92,000 for appropriation for Smith vote, like what's that for? They already have $5 million uh, seats. Again, we could, we could vote to, um, we could vote to cut the appropriation to Smith vocational or any other place. I'm not prepared to make any of those cuts tonight, but I do hear, I do hear the requests coming for that those are cuts that you would like to see this CS make. Um, and um, also, okay. just to be clear, we, we're not voting on this tonight, so that, so, so that. Okay, so not tonight, I know we have one. This is the hearing. We're not voting at all on the budget tonight? No, no this is a hearing. Okay, this so. This is a public hearing for the. But wasn't Mayor Narco was supposed to be here tonight to Talk about the budget. Talk about it. He's, no, he's he's actually no. He, he was just not us. It's just us. This is the council's. This is the council's hearing. Um, I mean, 
we I suppose we could have made a sink and insisted that he be here, not that it really would have really advanced the conversation necessarily. And there have been many opportunities, and there will be some more opportunities on June 11th if you'd like to come. In fact, we're discussing, we're having a hearing about some uh, some other departments discussing that. So, and the mayor should be here for that. But those won't have public comment, right? They won't have public comment, but right. you're invited to send your questions and stuff. So, what are those departments then? You know? uh, we have the schools. We have um, uh, Forbes Library, uh, <laughs> legal department, dispatch. dispatch what am I missing? Arts Council. Arts Council. <laughs> so anyway, if, if I might, um, for uh, it's really helpful to actually have some concrete suggestions of where we might cut because I think that that's pretty much what what we can do. So hearing from you and hearing where you think there are opportunities to cut the budget with the knowledge that we cannot then order the mayor to transfer those savings to the school department or to any other department in the city. Um, and so uh, I imagine that there may be other folks who have other cuts to suggest for us. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Tacey still wants to. If you <laughs> yeah. Um, th these grants that we get, these are snapshots in time. These are all things that, with the initial $100,000 for the, uh, the recreation park at Connecticut River, <coughs> it was a, it's a photo op. You know, the $100,000 to do this, and then Secretary Sullivan shows up, and you get your representative and your senator and the mayor, and it gets in the paper, and it's, so when you get to a meeting with your representatives or your senators, whoever the heck they might be, you don't start off the conversation with, hi, I'm a big supporter, you're doing a great job. Start it off with, this is what we need. I mean, we're not getting exactly what we need. We're not getting it from the state. We're not getting it from the federal government. Congress is not going to do a damn thing because they're dysfunctional. They've been dysfunctional for years. But somebody has got to somewhere along the line stand up and say, look it, this has got to be the end here. You're screwing us, and we know it. And you make some very valid points, but you have art and music, and you have many kids in the school system that do not necessarily do well in academics, but they excel in art and music. And that's, it, it might, be a, might be a limited number of students, but they're real people. These are real kids. So the ones that do well in academics are going to do well in academics anywhere. So right. when you teach French, Spanish, Latin, five years of it at the high school level, those courses, three, four, and five, you need two years of language to graduate from high school. Uh, those are cha may be changing. They may be changing. But you've got third, fourth, and fifth year language classes. That's higher education. That is stuff that is taught in every university in the community colleges. So why do we go right after art and music and physical education for kids? Why is it we go right after that and we don't go after third, fourth, and fifth year language classes that they can pick up in the colleges? Instead, we're going to take those that don't do well in academics, that do well in art and music, we are going to disenfranchise them absolutely. And we're going to hold harmless the students that do well in academics as it is. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't, you're cutting, you're, you're cutting in the places where you're going to go after the people, you're pulling at the heartstrings of people to pass an override to substantiate things that you don't absolutely necessarily have to have. I've got people on my ward that go to the grocery store with 20 bucks in their hand and they are wondering whether or not they're going to buy a half a gallon of milk or a quart of milk, or whether they're going to get butter today or are they going to get oleo. They're filling half of their prescription because they don't have the money to fill the whole prescription. And yet, I would never vote, I would never vote to push that anguish on any citizen. So if there's other places that we can cut in this budget, and in the school department needs to take notice of that also, I will not vote yes to push this on anybody in this city, to force them out of their homes. They've already taken all their exemptions. They're elderly, they're disabled. 114 years, this woman on my street, she's lived in that house with her, fa her family for 114 years. She cannot possibly hang on. She's disabled. 
it's brutal. And I see this. It's all over my ward. It's in your. It's in. It's, it's every ward in the city. That's so what anyway, I said. I'll, I'll stop. Lobby your legislators. No, that's what I said. Get him to change no. the formula. He I, asked Peter Colcott, Rep, uh, Gordon, uh, Mr. Murphy, asked Peter Colcott at the meeting at the JFK school about more money coming to Northampton out of the money that we spend. And you know what he said? His answer was, oh, I'm sorry. The formula does not allow for that. The formula does not allow for it. Well, let's change the formula. And I'm not done yet. No, I'm clearly. I'm sorry, go ahead. Change the damn formula. Get a hold of your legislature. Get a hold of your Peter Colcott. Get a hold of Stan Rosenberg. We have a new office right down here with a congressman, uh, McGovern. My God, be banging on their doors. Be banging on their doors and say, what the hell is going on here? Look at us. Look at us. We're going to divide the city again with an override. It's going to be you, the yes signs. Yes. Yes. The good people and the no's. So we're going to put, we're going to make this out to be good against bad. It's not the case. No. I'll stop. It never is. Council LaBarge and thank Council you. Freeman Daniels, you want to go after him? name on Facebook. You'll see her picture. She got a full scholarship at Amherst College. She just loves art, and I think e eventually she will become a great artist. I mean, if you get on Facebook, you'll see who I'm talking about. You'll see her artwork. It's just beautiful. I have to say that <coughs> what you're hearing tonight is absolutely true. Counselor Maureen Carney, has, ex has said to you exactly we are hearing what you have brought to our attention, okay? Thank you. And I appreciate that also. I'm glad that Counselor um, Owen Freeman Daniels had apparently brought up about the boathouse because as a counselor, I have heard people really concerned about how can we spend all that kind of money on a boat, okay? That, that is not true. We have nothing to do with that. Uh, yeah. Good. Okay. But I can see where you're coming at. Myself as a city councilor, I have several questions about Smith Vocational. You know, I'd like to see their revolving accounts. I'd like to see, like we're being told, how many students are coming in every year versus how many students from Northampton are actually being accepted? That's important to me versus the outside. So there's answers that I need yet. We're not <laughs> completed with this budget yet, but I, I appreciate you for being here this evening. And even with Joe, I, I agree with him too. There's concerns throughout this city. And I think he had a, a good value point also about where people can donate their money if they vote for yes do they want to add more or not on to it why not why not try it no, it goes with what i said about have a serious exemption okay for people that have to choose between bread or butter gene yeah okay those people have a buy they just totally have a buy more you know nothing okay low you know low income senior citizens I qualify as a senior citizen. When I go on the subway now, someone says, would you like a seat? I turn around and there's nobody there. So I'm learning. But anyway, um, and then to make up that difference, there you go. You leave the fund. Please, please. Wanna, he leave, oh, sorry. Yep, yep. People like Kim who want to donate money, and there's people in this town with money, hey, do it. And I would advise that if somebody wants to do that, you contact Marty Wall and the people that started the Northampton Education Foundation and in 10 years raised a million dollars in this city because they know how to raise money. And they're right here, and I'm sure they'd love to help people out on a free consult how to do that. You know, we have a lot of talent in this town. We should take advantage of it because, as, as Joe said, we have to do things in a new way. Okay. I just... Thank you. I just want to remind Thanks Councilor Tacey that, uh, especially his comments about the uh, language arts, that um, so far as I know, there's still time to take out papers for 
Ward 7 School Committee. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I think there's a seat for Ward 3, too. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Gaves, next. I'm Lily Gaves. Uh, I live on, in Florence on Route 66, which was a model project <coughs> in the feather in New Santee's cap and a headache in ours. But um, is the budget where I understand the decisions for which streets get to be streets or no not. the budget the budget no. is actually the, that's a different process it's a different the, the, the pro, you're talking about the private privatization private streets versus right. public streets that's actually separate from the budget although you know it does it will impact or reflect on the budget not this fiscal year but probably next fiscal year um, and so that's part of the conversation. It's also one of the drivers that, and the fact that the state because it involves plowing and right, maintenance right, and right. changing light bulbs. Exactly. And, and the state, what drove this was originally that the state has since. Well, historically, the state, as you described and others have described, the state's roads were. You know, the joke is they they the the goats planned out the. The paths and the roads that we created and then historically evolved over didn't involve a whole lot of planning and subsequently a lot of things historically kind of were fudged and things like Board, that. It was order, Mr. Chair. Yeah. I think the answer to this one is short. Yeah. The what? question was, is this part of the budget piece? All right, so that's what and I'm asking. The answer is yeah. no, it's not, but there will be a discussion later on the agenda. Okay. And it really and is not. A piece. Is, so, so piece. all right, so can, can I say anything now about? about center court that involves that I would, think very specifically be, uh, the city council uh, not at this time because it's a budget hearing okay so and when might I address the city council because I think being that you serve your constituents in each neighborhood of the city your particular relationships with the utilization of center court as right. community well, councilors Adams Robert, and myself are the councilors at large. Your ward councilor, I believe, is Councilor Schwartz. No, me. She lives right yeah. near me. No, no, for Center Court. No, 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 for Center, Center Court. Court. Oh, I'm, Center that's Court. where your Downtown, business she's is. Downtown, behind the Masonic Building. Well, yeah, that's where her business yeah, is. Yeah, and that's, that's Ward 4. So um, you, uh, we can meet with you at some point at, at an appropriate time to discuss that. Um, but yeah, right now is not the the time or place. Okay, because I think it the it's not the my ward that needs to hear my comments. It's the city council as a whole because of your responsibility to residents of Northampton. Well, I think well, that's what distinguishes us. Thank you. We we did hear your comment at public comment, and that is the appropriate time to make that. All right. S yeah, I know. Well. I As do we. We, 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 heard, we heard you at public comment. Right, I know. And, and I'm uh, asking when the that was next it. time that I could address that was the it. city council. But if you oh, want to address the city oh, council, this is public what? comment. If you want to address the city council. Um, um, so, folks, you're, you're free to contact anyone on the city council. All our names and addresses, okay. phone numbers, so and email addresses. Are right uh, you can send letters and, and emails right. and call okay. to your. Um, as, as much as you All know. right, thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak to the budget? Councilors, any? Uh, Dennison? I really don't want to. All right. Well, we don't want to anyway. force you. All right. <coughs> Please uh, identify. I just asked a question. Uh, Dennison Wolf, 1 Isabella Street, Northampton, Mass. Uh, and I work at Smith Folk. And I just want to ask the question uh, your people are saying. I want to know more about the Smith Folk budget. Is that going to happen? Is there going to be a discussion with public comment about the Smith Folk budget before this budget? The, we had a hearing uh, already w without public comment, but it was a hearing for relative to that budget. Now would be the time to make that. Yeah. The, the budget, they've since uh, presented an amended budget at our request uh -huh. that conforms to the budget that was laid out before they were asking for more money. The um, the larger debate relative to Smith Vocational clearly is looks like that's looming at some point, but it's not scheduled. It's but it's looming. We won't have it now. You're welcome to actually. No, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm I'm very happy to wait in when the looming comes. Expect us, as they say. Right. But uh, just 
on the point of whether whether the superintendent has now done what he should do and could do, I mean, there was no extra in the budget. What you got was the elimination of a position, which is my position, and half of another position. And so I said, have you had a bad week? I'm the Quaker at Smith Volk, and I resigned a position two weeks before it was eliminated. So. <laughs> is, that, is that a result of the amended budget that they uh, the, the amended budget is the elimination of a position. Two of us left. And as a result of that, too, he's combining it into one. Right. And that's where the money savings comes from. Um, and that doesn't count, for whatever reason, benefits. And there's another person leaving, not being replaced by attrition. He's taking money out of the admin budget when he's able to. But there isn't, like, extra money. You can't cut the copper budget for plumbing. You can't buy less lumber and educate kids to build houses. You can't not buy paint for painting cars and teach kids trades. And I just want to say that the value of vocational student graduating in your community is somewhat higher than the value of an academic student who leaves to go to college somewhere else and starts accruing debt with no hope of a job. We're educating kids for jobs, and it's worth more. And it's completely different to be the superintendent of a 21st century vocational school than a superintendent of five elementary schools and jail for kids in a high school. So I just encourage you to look at the Smith Folk budget a different way than saying we need to cut this or that. And as you say, 60% of your budget is the school department, and you don't have school committee members because they don't have much authority over that budget either. It's all in to salary to, to union employees and retirements. And that's the same thing at Smith Volk. A big chunk of that budget is in salary to, to union employees. So when you start cutting lines there, you're cutting bone, not just me. That's all. And um, I know there'll be a discussion about what happens to Smith Volk, and you know, we'll come to that. Uh, What's it called, JFK again? Oh, it's JFK, J John F. Kennedy Middle School. Oh, I heard jail for kids. Okay. Well, a lot of people, a lot of people say that. I took my son out of it because we had a great time at, at elementary school in Northampton, a great experience at uh, Jackson Street. We went to uh, JFK. We moved to a charter school, and then we came back to the high school and had another great experience. But that's not really a budget question. It's it's a difference in what a superintendent does in a vocational school and in the school department. Um, and I, it, if it's any comfort, uh, that actually those the, the <coughs> points that you brought up came up during the course of that budget hearing. Um, there, were, uh, and I think it was universally expressed that we value, and without you know, it's we're not just fobbing anyone off. We truly value uh, the unique status <coughs> that the, the Northampton. Well, what we benefit from from the Smith Vocational and Agricultural School, and then also for the region. And um, but as you also said, it requires scrutiny and the discussion. And it, this is the first year, actually, that we've actually ever spoken with uh, anyone from Smith Vocational relative to their budget line. And because previously it was always done on a personal basis between a superintendent and a mayor who were doing good communication. There was there was that, and there was but there was also uh, the fact that the, the, just the same with the school committee, they have an elected body that, that presides over it, and um, it, it just it, it's appropriate because we we offer the same scrutiny for the schools, uh, the the other Northampton <laughs> public schools, and it's it's only appropriate that we. I mean, we, it, particularly during this time of the override, that it, it, it would be enormously irresponsible if we did not uh, review the, the funding and the lines. I'm very much not trying to go to the larger discussion, just to advocate it on behalf of Smith folks. And I appreciate it, that. No, I appreciate he's, that. He's done what he's able to do. Councilor Freeman James. I called it that, too, when I went there. Well, he, he, he's fair to criticize me. I shouldn't have said that. So. I apologize, Mr. Casey. My kid called it that, too. All the kids I know call it. Yeah, see, all the kids call it. Thank it's, you. it's a term of affection. That. What's that? It does not call it that. All right. Currently there, doesn't call it. All right. Yeah, you know okay. Uh, now that we've we've settled uh, any number of things, not the least of which JFK, what JFK stands for, <laughs> uh, are there any other comments on the budget, relative to the budget? Any more comments from the council floor? I move we take five. Oh, uh, well, I wanna, uh, uh, Jackie, did you want to speak? We'll, we'll pop up to the microphone and identify yourself. Uh, well, there's more opportunity like this prior to the override, though. No, not for the, this is the public budget hearing. This is the purpose of this. Public comment. Uh, uh, there's, the only time remaining after that is public comment. 
and and in that case we're not allowed to respond so all questions would be rhetorical at that point it'd be um, which they often are but if you if you have a question now uh, now's the moment well please come up and speak I mean honestly this is this is the time come on Come on, Jackie. Come on. <laughs> right. I think I think no, we're all if, friends you wanna, here. if you want to attack us without us being able to respond, then then do it at public comment. But if you want the why council to actually why, take your you take your comments attack? seriously, then I think you should come right up. Hey, Jack, Jackie, for the record, please identify yourself. And um, I'm Jackie Misa. I live at 95 West Street in Northampton. Um, <coughs> I do want to speak address City Council prior to the override vote but those comments would have more to do with um, procurement practices um, that was that's my intention I've heard a number of things this evening that make me wonder a little more um, number one I have written here is uh, you say that excuse me 62 percent of the budget goes to schools and we, we've heard about pensions and salaries and such, but and with little to show for it, based on your own words here tonight. How can that be? 62% of the budget with little to show for where teachers are buying their own supplies. Um, we have, we have the, the privilege of CPA, CPA funds. Um, we also have the highest incidence of overrides at least in Western Mass, and someone said in the state. Um, we have an option here in town. We have a large entity. Um, the mayor had spoken of this, um, or heard, listened to this discussion or argument, um, I think prior to his inauguration and, and certainly after, um, the option to discuss um, greater pilot payments from Smith College. That discussion seems to have disappeared um, someone wrote a very good piece Jesus Leva recently reintroduced that at the 11th hour um, and then uh, there's my observation or experience with procurement but um, and we can be going after these Smith additional Smith College dollars or for non for all nonprofits <coughs> like not just Smith there are a number of nonprofits in town <laughs> CPA money um, highest incidence of overrides, 62% of the budget going to the schools, but there's nothing, but they're broke, flat broke. So again, kind of rhetorical questions here. It doesn't make sense. Well, Things they're don't not rhetorical questions. I think those are reasonable questions that, that um, any number of people are willing to answer. I'm going to go with Councilor Spector first, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Did Councilor Shorts? Okay. okay. Well, I, I wouldn't say that the schools are flat broke. In fact, there are programs there now which are incredible, uh, specifically, and you heard about the art and the music programs. The North Hamptons, which have a musical director who would be cut, is an incredible program. More than just, often as you say, uh, Councilor Tacey, kids can excel in art and music. And it's not even necessarily that those kids are going to stay in art and music, but it helps them in a lot of ways. They've got three and, CDs out. And they're, yeah. But whether they do that or they go on to other things, they're incredibly good programs for helping people to learn. And there are a lot of great programs currently at the school. There were a lot. There were even more programs when my kids were at school, so we've been cutting and cutting and cutting. As uh, Mr. Brill said, that we've had many programs there which have been nationally recognized, and we're great in that. We used to have more. I also agree that sport, I think sports are very important. They're not just about playing the sport. I think there's something about sports in our schools which are incredibly important, and we've seen those cut back where the cost for parents on those programs go up and up and up to the point where it's, it's getting difficult. And we've talked at times about cutting even more sports programs. So I think we still have great schools. I don't think they're as great as they were. I think we've cut too much. I think it's very difficult for teachers to teach with a class of 30 or 32. We know one of the, the most important things is for teachers to have smaller class sizes. I think given that, and again, we had one of the, a really great teacher who was up here, uh, who my kids had just a few years ago, fantastic education with this teacher. However, he's leaving. I'm not sure how much he's leaving because he has more and more of a burden of, of students. But I think we still have great schools. I'm afraid of where they're going. I'd say we have good schools, and I'm afraid with where they're going. And I, I would like to see at least the quality we have now maintained. Um, 
And your rhetorical <laughs> question, which was not rhetorical, <laughs> is that the, the short answer, and, and people will expand on that, is the state's commitment to the investment in schools and the state's commitment to investment in infrastructure has reduced enormously, epically. And it's why, that, I mean, that contributes, that is the single largest contributing factor to the straits that we find ourselves in. And Councilor Freeman, you have Councilor Schwartz, you have not. Uh, thank you. I, um, this is a quibble, but I'm not sure where, um, I thought it was more like 50% of the of the uh, city's budget goes toward the school. And Council Murphy would address this, but it, it's yeah, it's right. when you when you combine uh, to pension right. obligations <laughs> and you can sixty eight debt service sixty eight debt service we have service yeah S over sixty <laughs> million dollars in employee benefits. Well, the bulk of the, the greatest majority of our employees are school employees, so you have to add a prorated portion of that into the school budget. So when you take a majority of that $16 million for employee benefits and assign that to the school employees, that's what kicks us way up there. But it is, it's on our side of the budget, not on their side of the budget. We pay for it on our side. But if we assigned it person for person to our largest department, the schools, it would kick them up over that. Okay. That's where that comes from. I, I just, um... yeah. But it, it, the pie chart's different, but that's because right. their share of that is on our side. Yeah. And, uh, and that includes Smith Lowe. <coughs> the employee benefits. Yeah, they're on, and, and for they're the, on our, for that the part education, of our right. side, too. Uh, I, I have to concur with Councilor Spector. I mean, to say that we have nothing to show for it, or I don't think it's really accurate, but I do think that, uh, I mean, because we graduate uh, great students, and, um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of them. Um, well, and uh, okay, so <laughs> fair, fair students the then. You know, fair students. But 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 I, uh, I understand that. Ernie Brill agrees with you. I, yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I want to hear more about what you what you say about procurement practices because that's a part of the budget that we don't and, look at right. that much. Um, okay. As far as the uh, the pilot programs, uh, <laughs> you know, we we have. We do have a lot of nonprofits in this city, and we have a very large one. Um, I, I don't think that uh, I, I'm very proud of, of uh, Smith College <coughs> for um, yes, we know the they do, <laughs> and, uh, and for that. the uh, and for the um, adjustments that they've been making to modern education and to uh, the and city, especially modern and into education the geography. for women. Um, you know, they uh, they have the right to do with their land what they what they uh, see is f for the future and they have what they have they have their own plans for the future and I, and I think that they're very laudable uh, offering engineering programs to um, uh, in a women's <coughs> program is uh, is a is I think fantastic and, and the city has been the beneficiary of that um, and this the college has to remain healthy and uh, and strong and on the cutting edge which it has done and uh, continues to do I um, I'm sure that uh, from everyone's perspective on the city side, we can we can always say that they could do more, and um, the college has no legal obligation to do so. And um, well, that's kind of like the parking I, ticket I'd thing. I'd like to have a. I'd like to. Ha we might have a discussion maybe on the state or federal level whether that's worthwhile to uh, compel these institutions that uh, it's seem that like as though excuse me uh, what seem as though they have a lot of money. Um, who really actually end up spending quite a bit of it um, on uh, on their own on the tuition of their own students? Um, the the as far as the funding for Smith goes, they look more like a public university than a private college when you look at how much money they give out in in um, scholarships and uh, and grants to their to their students. Um, so I think that the Smith College, you know, we can always have that conversation. Um, but it's uh, it's not a sustainable conversation. It's not a conversation that we're going to be able to say, um, oh, that that fixes our budget f for the foreseeable future. Um, so uh, so I appreciate the comment, but uh, the pilot program um, is really just sort of. I think it's valuable for very large, very well-off institutions like Harvard, but. Uh, when we when we talk about Smith College, we're talking about a school that uh, that 
is very different from that. May Jackie, you, you certainly, you may have. Absolutely. Oh, where to begin? Um, so in essence, you're saying the city of Northampton is subsidizing Smith College <coughs> students in that we are giving them a healthy basis for their ability to subsidize their students. That's just a very new novel thought for me. Do you have more questions than that? Sure. Okay, um, so. I, you would also like to say, since we're all talking in public, that you have a very strong bias toward the school as your mother has been a professor there. Is that correct? Is that accurate? It, Again, if you have is that, it's a yes or no question. I, it's Jackie, it's a yes or no and I question. prefer that we keep this on the budget as opposed to ad hominem. But it is. You, but you're debating his motives for his discussion. Okay, but he's also making it as, as an exclusive statement, an absolute statement. These are absolute statements he's seeming to... I'm not talking about absolute present. statements. I'm saying in order okay, to advance a conversation. Um, it, I, think, I think it's wholly appropriate to, to argue the point of whether a, a pilot versus non-pilot sure. or aggressively pursuing. Sure. What Councilor Freeman Daniels' pedigree is is not appropriate. I didn't use the word pedigree at all. I, I said did. bias. I did. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is I'm just saying that it, that's not necessarily germane to the point. Because okay. when we wade into that point, this is okay. then we get to the point the Councilor uh, Tacey was concerned about was the divisions and the schisms. Okay. And so if you, and and it's wholly appropriate to debate and discuss the validity of a pilot, which I actually agree with you. Mm -hmm. So, but the fact is, is that, and, and, and I should point out actually, the conversation has not disappeared. We, in fact, the conversation's about to change. <laughs> you now, you now have a new mayor, you have a new president of, the, of Smith College. And, um, a pilots pilots have been approached from a variety of different angles and that's for all and for large nonprofit systems in the community to figure out how we can make we can make an arrangement we're not necessarily dealing from a position of strength because as as Councilor Freeman Daniels did point out it's they're legally entitled to say no thank you but the the fact and and I would say that to Jesus as well that this is this is not falling off the radar and is not and people haven't run away from that conversation. It is an ongoing conversation, which I'm saying, and the topography is changing, and we'll see how that, what that pans out to be. So, but, so I'm sorry. So, if you want to respond to, so the mayor has pro, uh, proposed an override vote before seriously discussing and pursuing pilots. Uh, Councilor Schwartz, do you want to address that? Um, that? That's just not true. It's and, not true? No, it's not How, true. And there's conversations. Please. I'm not going to speak for the mayor, but mm -hmm. I can just tell you that you, you, with all due respect, I don't think you know enough to be making those I comments. disagree with that okay. strongly. So I, there's, there's a history to the pilot issue. There's, there's, a, there's no. a, a history in conversation with Mayor Higgins, with then Mayor Higgins. Mm -hmm. There's, there is, I think that the, the pilot issue is a valid one that deserves our time and attention. That uh, I think that is is receiving it in a on a path that may not be at the pace that you approve of. But uh, it's to say a blanket. He's pursuing an override instead of the pilot. The, uh, we have a gap of 1.4 million dollars. We have a state that has a deprive that has cut our local aid to the point where were we level funded since fiscal year 2002, we would have 35 million more dollars. There is not a mystery here about why we have, are in the position that we're in. There, are we continuing to cost save? Are we not budget, we are budget cutting. We are implementing every local option tax that's available to us. The bottom line is we cannot <coughs> make up <coughs> loss in state aid at this rate without an override. Disagree. Um, there is a discussion of the 400k in stipends that are handed out, in addition to salaries and pension. There's been the discussion of vehicles. Procurement will be another topic, and then you also just digress from this very specific discussion of, of pursuing the override. Can Going I, after the property can owners, can I just say again? individual property owners, for a permanent override versus having a large, important discussion with one of the largest, or if not the largest, landholder in the city. The, the and, and others, and others, not just the college, and others, other revenue options. Councilor <coughs> you, you well remember the conversation of the Green Street neighborhood 
Yeah, houses being you all remember we all remember this. Uh, I've inherited Smith College as a landlord as a result of that. That wasn't expected, but that's the reality. So anyway, but didn't, didn't choose it. Pilot, didn't choose it. Uh, it was a pilot program that was that was reached. Um, it was a negotiation with the mayor, and but small chump change well, essentially. It was, well, it allow him to finish. Sixty-one thousand dollars. Wow. So uh, Jackie, please allow him to finish and yes, don't I, interrupt you while you're talking. Yeah. So it came to sixty-one thousand dollars, and then there was another small piece that was involved, which was the street, and the total came to sixty-seven thousand dollars. And then, at the end of the agreement, Smith College said they would provide that sixty-seven thousand dollars as tax revenue through a pilot program for the city of Northampton. Mm -hmm. And I don't. I, and I, the part that I never heard that is actually written into the end of the agreement is that if they replaced all of that housing with low low or moderate income housing in the community that whatever that property was assessed at they would be forgiven that particular amount of money so actually with, there's three properties one is on state street uh and there's there's two others uh, off the top of my head i can't remember just exactly where they are but it came to about forty-seven thousand dollars worth of exemptions for the college. So for the sixty-seven thousand dollars, the property was assessed at that they tore down. We get something less than twenty thousand dollars on that. That's what our. That's what we get mm -hmm. from the Smith College for that property. Also, they were building a parking garage, and that was <laughs> going to be. It was going to pay taxes. They were going to pay taxes on that garage. That was the conversation that went through this council, went through every uh, different board and chamber. And then what happened was they built the garage and they owned out or rented spaces or leased spaces to professors, which then it fell under chapter 40 and it was tax exempt. So, uh, Jackie, did you want there's, to? There, 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 there's all kinds of stuff. That I'd like to speak to another one of Ms. Uh, Councillor Freeman Daniels' um, responses um, about the financial health of the. Well, it wasn't supposed to be a focus on Smith, but and other nonprofits. But since he's, we've discussed this in detail, and since I have firsthand knowledge of a lot of the back and forth and the doings and the finances, well, in terms of properties being bought and sold. Um, we need a, a healthy Smith, but we also need a healthy residential tax base, and we need to keep people in the city, and we need to keep merchants in the landlord-owned shops. Smith College paid $945,000 in September of 2006 for 21 Belmont Avenue above market price. The same day, they spent $1.3 million on two other homes, 95 West Street and 69 Belmont Avenue. The nine hundred and forty-five thousand dollars, sixty-one thousand, forty-seven thousand. The nine hundred and forty-five thousand dollars structure was a seven-unit rental property in very fine condition compared to many of the rental properties in town, and that was leveled um, this past September. It is now lawn. They paid nine hundred and forty-five thousand dollars plus to have a lawn. Um, 27 Belmont was purchased a long time ago. They continue to buy properties all in that <coughs> corridor. But I hear comments about the concern for their financial health um, compared to Harvard. They're healthy, perhaps to our detriment, wiping out residential properties, affordable housing, and I don't mean subsidized. No one has ever meant subsidized. We're talking about homeless people here and benches and housing is actively being wiped out by an institution, a tax-exempt institution, that is paying top dollar for properties and erasing them. So, uh, Councilor, do you want to, you want to respond, or Councilor Specter, you had your hand up as well, and you hadn't spoken. I'd like to respond. Sure. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'd like to say two things. One, I do not believe that uh, assessing the um, the purchase price for what is clearly Smith's Smith College has clearly a long-term plan for that er that area of, of its own properties uh, assessing the purchase price does not indicate that their operating budget can afford what is an unsus for, for 
a pilot, a, a, hel a very large pilot program, number one. Number two, even if they could, it's not sustainable. We as city um, councilors, even though I'm not going to be around uh, next year, we city councilors cannot come to rely on a, an agreement that may not be renewed uh, year in and year out. That's not a sustainable practice for the city. We might be able to uh, work out some sort of long-term arrangement uh, that, that we would be able to budget, to adequately work into the budget, but that is going to take some time. It's certainly the outgoing president would not commit Smith <coughs> to, to that kind of long-term agreement. And also, I don't believe that Smith College would, would sign a, a very <coughs> large long-term agreement because they have their own long-term projections. And I, I disagree with you. I don't think they're as good as you think. But, and then the second part, the second part uh, to my point, uh, so that, that's just the, about the pilot and its impact on the budget. It may be that I think we might get a, come to a time where we'll be able to reasonably count on some pilot funding um, but I don't think that it's wise to build that into the budget uh, because it can be, they have no legal obligation to pay it. Uh, and they, and, and so they may not, unless they sign some sort of legal obligation to pay it. And, and that's, I would be very surprised if they uh, signed anything that was more than a one or two year arrangement. Uh, and I think that's, it's foolhardy to rely on that. It's, it's really unsustainable. And the other part is that um, I think We've heard you talk about uh, procurement, uh, and um, I'm not sure what it is that you're talking about when you come to procurement practices, whether that's in the budget, but I, I'm not sure if, other than that, I haven't heard much relating to the budget here that is what we're here for. Revenue. We're talking about revenue. Budget equals revenue. That the whole point of the override is to gather revenue. So you're saying that it makes more sense to um, burden mom and dad and Sue and Joe in perpetuity yet again over a large, the largest land holding institution it's, in the so city. The, so the question is whether it's, it's a burden and we're gonna find that out on June 25th. And, 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 and second question, let's, where, that's what we've heard, we've heard order, the pilot. Just, just, a sec, just a second, please, just a second. The uh, more critical, the more salient feature here, yeah. in your no opinion. pilot will figure into the 2014 budget. Right. So, had a point of order. That but, was yeah. a point of order. It takes precedent. I think that chair, it takes precedent, which is, I think these are very valid points that we should be debating. But really, the topic here, we can go all over. The topic is this budget for next year. And it's an interesting point to think about future budgets. But this is a budget hearing on this budget. So I'm, I was just going to make a point of order that at some point. That, that was my okay. point of order. Thank so you. I, I trumped your point of order, and I'm <laughs> sorry. It's OK. Um, but the, 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 and to that point, it's if. Because I think ongoing, and this has been ongoing, the conversation about a pilot is not ruled out of it. Correct, because unlike mom and dad and Joe and Sue, the institution's been here for over 125 years. I hear you. I hear what you're saying. I'm just saying and that, it's not that going to go any place. there, will be, no, there will be no pilot, regardless, for the 2014 budget. And that is why an override is being asked for. If I'm just extrapolating from that, but it, that is why an override is being asked for, because there is no pilot in existence now, so it can't be applied towards the budget. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what we're charged with addressing here. We've we've been all over the map, clearly. I mean, we've we've identified any number of things and pressure points and conflicts and and concerns, and um, that is actually part of the public discourse. It's appropriate, but beyond that, I mean, I think I think if you if there are some particular procurement practices now that you see represented in this budget or some other items that are represented in this budget for FY 2014, that we need to hear. We need to hear from you. Right. And if you have those, we'd, I'd prefer, I'd, I'd be pleased to hear them. So. Unfortunately, I'm not prepared to address them this evening. I had intended to, but then <coughs> it, kind of for various reasons have given up on it. But, but unfortunately, <laughs> we have, we're having the, I thought the, I thought this actually hearing was supposed to occur next week. There is another hearing next week, and that's, that's another, Council budget hearing where we're hearing from departments. So it's not, there won't be the public give and take that you're experiencing now. Okay. But that doesn't, now, you're still, Jackie, you can still write up something, submit it to, for the public record. Mm -hmm. it's, it'll be distributed to all the councils as well. Mm -hmm. So if you want to itemize it or make some other points particularly relevant to this budget, 2014, that's 
that's wholly appropriate. And, um, and in fact, this will be debated on the council floor uh, eventually when we when it comes to the vote on this budget, um, which will take place. The first reading will take place before the override. <coughs> the second vote will take after the override, depending the override vote, depending, and it will be determined by the outcome of that election. So there will be more opportunity to speak to these points in public session and as well. Gene? Yeah. I'm just Councilor <coughs> Tacey. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay, Bill. Did it again. <laughs> Did it again. <laughs> I, I don't want anybody to, to, to walk away. Whatever Smith College does or does not put into our budget is beyond me. But we also, I don't want anybody to forget that the downtown Northampton <coughs> is vibrant and it is every bit a part college campus as Smith College proper is it's every bit a part of it so whether or not they put in or they don't put in that's another there's arguments on both sides of that um, would your downtown be as vibrant without Smith College do and they, they pay for fire protect do they right. pay for this right. they do they right. it's a huge asset you discuss assets such as our school system right? and Smith Volk and, and Smith College uh, my grandmother went to work at, before child labor laws. She was born in 1897. She went to work at Smith College in 1908. Mm -hmm. And she worked there all of her life. She died in 1985. I mean, <clears throat> I, 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 it's an emotion. It's a, it's a compassionate argument. And I, I try to, in my own head, try to figure out in a way the importance of this college. This college is tremendously important. Of course. And I, I know we can try and strong arm or, or, or whatever, but we have to also be very careful. We have to balance, it's a balancing act on just exactly how important it is and how much do we want to push them. Um, uh, but you're, but that's the point. Imagine without the college. That's a, large part of the, that's a large part of the point, pushing them. The chair point it's not a matter of pushing again, them. It's you, a matter of the chair. Stick to the topic. This well, is about yeah. well, but, 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 next year. But I'm going year. back to the okay. But I'm going back to the people pushing. You're pushing people this out of town with the override. Excuse me, but this also is not. A, and this, this doesn't okay. have the All override right. in this budget. Exactly. It is very fair okay. to come in. It is very fair to come in, as some other people did, or as you have said you would, mm -hmm. to say here's areas where we could cut this budget. Mm -hmm. That is a very that is appropriate to this <clears> conversation. <throat> okay. This is not about the override or not. This does not include the override. This discussion is about this budget. We are open to hearing where could we make, where is the council, we could make cuts in this budget. It's helpful to hear. There have been a couple of suggestions this evening that mm -hmm. we're spending too much on police cars. Mm -hmm. Maybe we are, maybe we should look at that. Mm -hmm. But any suggestions, you mentioned procurement. Mm -hmm. If you have suggestions, as mm -hmm. the council president said, you could send those in to us. But that's the discussion. It doesn't even include the override in this budget. And again, it might be my failing eyes, but I didn't look at the schedule specifically, and I didn't see the, the hearing discussion for this evening, so I apologize. But I, again, I was responding to some of the, the comments, too. Uh, it, this is publicly advertised uh, several weeks in advance, actually. Do you have any other uh, questions or recommendations to the FY2014? Not this moment tonight, no, but perhaps in writing. We're, we're available, too. I know. You can contact me on Facebook. I know. Um, anyone else interested in commenting on the budget Thank or you, making suggestions tonight? Uh, I'll entertain a motion to close the hearing. Motion to close. Oh, second. Sure. It's just to close the hearing. Just, uh, just, a, just, just, relative, just, a, just a, a relatively quick general comment, but um, it, it, it's budget related in that most of the discussion tonight has been about our only mechanism to fund this budget, which is an override, and the fact that we've got two budgets, one if it passes and one if it doesn't pass, and people's greatest concerns expressed here tonight has been what happens if it doesn't pass. We're discussing uh, the, the mechanism, and, and the problem is we're not a financially viable entity because we can't level service budget, we have to level fund budget, a and that's to the core of the problem, and health care labor and fuel expenses since the inception of Proposition Two and a Half make us unviable because we're going to hit the wall every three years or so. Even if we get if we get an override, it's good for about three years, and then labor contracts and fuel costs and health care and insurance make us hit the wall again. And the override is really our only option because of the way the state allows us to raise funds, and that's what I mentioned to Peter Kokot at the S meeting was you've got to respect the fact that there's 351 cities and towns of Massachusetts that are not financially viable 
because the only thing we can do is go back to our property taxpayers and say, pay us more. Now, some people say, well, that was the design of the system. I could see Proposition 2 and a half for capital improvements. Do you want a new school? Do you want a new police station? Do you want something like that? But just to maintain level services over a three to five year period, the inability to do that means we're not financially viable. <coughs> and capital improvements, yes. Day to day, no. And I would say again, the state really needs to get us other sources of revenue that are dedicated to cities and the expenses of cities and towns. And that needs to come from the general tax burden overall at this point, whether they choose to, to set, sell, share the meals tax with us. And we send five and a half million dollars a year out of here on meals tax to the state. They gave us three quarters of a percent. We send that much money to them every year in the hopes that they'll give us aid. But unfortunately, we're, in their eyes, economically viable because we could, you know, the tax rate is 14 26 now. It could go up to $25 <coughs> under Proposition 2 and a half. I mean, we could override it that far, but it isn't, it's very, very regressive to do that. They really need to find other sources of revenue so that we can use the override process for capital improvements, but that we could, at the very least, level service every year with the, within the scope of the existing tax burden, state and local, so that we can do the things we need to do. And it's totally disrespectful to all the cities and towns in Massachusetts that the legislature does not choose to own up to that problem and deal with it. And that's my general comment about all Thank this. Thank you. Um, uh, there was a motion to close the hearing. I did. Oh. No, I did. Motion. You I made that motion, yeah. and, is there, and there was a second? Second. All those in favor of closing the public hearing? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Aye. And Thank you. And yep. uh, there's a motion to call for a break. Uh, let me just that? say that. I'll second. <laughs> I'll third Five. it. Five. We're going to recess. <laughs> that public hearing was a little over three hours. I appreciate everyone's participation. I'm very grateful for it. And uh, we will reconvene in about seven minutes. Well, welcome back. We're, uh, we haven't even convened the city council meeting yet. Uh, so first, um, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. He did. Well, that was for the hearing. Does that come for the council? She did. Yeah. Okay. Woo, we don't have to do that. Um, now, we've been discussing during the recess and how we can actually pare down this agenda so that we, some of the stuff that we can defer because uh, we, sp we heard from three people in the course of three hours for the public hearing. So now, um, in order to conform to our rules, which require us to call for adjournment at 11, um, that there are some things that we can move back for the next meeting there are some things that need to move up one of the things that i'd like to move up with the council's indulgence is um having terry masters come to speak on the uh parcel of village hill um but before we do that uh mary what what's what's the stuff that we can move on to uh the next meeting that's so we should work this out here is before we there the resolutions that are before us the one on vibrant sidewalks and the one on the sponsored one uh, for gun control from the youth commission um i'm not sure what the council's pleasure is on that i think the gun control one can certainly be postponed until the next meeting as a presentation on that i'm not sure, sure. I, I would ask uh Councilor carney how she would feel about deferring that to the next the next meeting um i, I suppose it, it yeah i mean it, it, given the time it's 10 30. right mm -hmm. i think um, i think part of the pressure is of course we want to have that needs that clearly the community gave us a sense that they want a full vetting and a discussion of that and i think that's appropriate to devote the time that we won't have tonight the way it's right. shaped so why we'll we'll um so we'll we'll <coughs> cut up the resolutions the uh, the street acceptance issues we the mary is now given us yeah can, we, can I make a brief one minute announcement yeah no i'm not by oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yes, okay. no, we're still doing that i'm just uh, also the i'm just talking but we're, we're right now we're trying to pare down the agenda so that we can do this <laughs> in appropriate fashion the uh so i i'm gonna i move that do we consider Resolution one and two next uh, to next meeting. Second. Second it. All those in favor of uh, resolution one and two. 
I'm sorry, it's, you're not allowed to actually speak from the floor at this point. This is a council thing, so uh, it's, it, it's on the agenda and you can see it. It is not the streets. It's not, it's not the, streets. the streets. It's not the streets. It's not the streets. Um, the motion is to move the resolutions uh, for to support vibrant sidewalks and also regulating high capacity weapons uh, to the next meeting. Move to move. That's, that's mo moved. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, Sorry? That's correct. That was just the resolutions. That was the motion. Um, relative to the issues on street approval, acceptance, and um, disapproval, which is we, uh, we, as I said, I was speaking, we have these packets that were just handed to us. And I think I, I hate to do this to uh, Ned and Terry. <laughs> No, no, I no. think we should. I think we should. They stayed here. This. Yeah, they've been here for they three hours. Here. They've I think been we here since. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to say that yeah. we can stay here for the extra time. I know. All right. Look at how okay. They were getting. Yeah. All right. So I'm voting no at eleven. Uh, <laughs> it's just the council has given us his notice of intent. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we can move the reports of the committees. Is everyone? Do I hear a motion to that? I motion to reports one through four from com uh, one through three. Under reports of committees, be moved to the next meeting. I already removed. Is there a second. Like I already. There's a motion, a second, and another motion, the same one. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, we do need to recess for finance. That will not pass because that has to get referred out. The um, so. Um, That's an easy one. Get it out okay. of the way. All right. All right. Let's get this meeting started then. Um, yeah, let's start with this. This upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narco, it's ordered that whereas the city of Northampton wishes to target and promote investment and economic growth in the city of Northampton, specifically at the plan Christopher Heights Assisted Living Facility, <coughs> now therefore be ordered to designate the Village Hill development parcel located at Village Hill Drive and Moser Street as an economic opportunity area for Christopher Heights economic opportunity area. And uh, Attorney Masters is here. Second. Second. Motion to approve. And second. Move to recognize Terry Masters. Second. Uh, all those in favor, recognize. Aye. 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 Terry, come on up. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the Village Hill development is an EOA. The state has asked us to create a EOA within the existing one for this specific building as part of the overall services and incentive package for the Village Hill development, <coughs> excuse me, the Christopher Heights 83-unit assisted living facility. The Massachusetts Economic Development Board is going to meet on June 25th to approve the overall package. And we had passed a resolution um, agreeing to the TIF, which is the trigger for the other incentives, the the how the um, the how the community development. Um, I'm not sure the specific title of it, but um, the TIF that worked out to offset against was it historic credit credits or the Grantham Group was the yes. uh, the Grantham Group. So this is just a part of the overall clerical package that they need to see to approve it on the 25th that Council we des designated. So the state asked the city to pass this so that it would, they would become eligible for some credits that, the, that they're applying for? Correct. Is that kind of the idea? Yes. Okay. yes. Affordable housing credits. What, and Affordable, right. Okay. Yes. It's a, yeah, Mary points out that we do this for every tip. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. <laughs> Part of the tea ceremony we do with the state. So we've already been dissing them all night. But Lots of sizzle, no steak. Lots of sizzle, no steak. That was, um, any other questions for Terry on this? Um, Terry, I understand that they want two readings on this tonight? Okay. So that's the request. Um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. timing involved in the two readings, naturally? Yeah, the, the meeting's on the 25th. Yeah, to comply. Okay, thank you. The 25th. Yep. First All right, so the, the first reading is moved. All those Second. Is, uh, this is going to require a roll call. Uh, is it an or it's neither an ordinance or an appropriation? No, it's not. Okay, let's. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? 
Move to suspend Move. rules for second reading. Second. second. Aye. All those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. 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 Opposed? Move, move second reading. Second. Aye. <laughs> second. Okay. It's moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor on second reading? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Thank you, Terry. I, I hope you had a good time tonight. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> See you later. I'll come back now you're here. All right, let's do the one minute announcements and shake those out of the way. Uh, Councilor Adams, you had to end up before anyone else. Um, I, I'm just announcing that at the public safety meeting in September, which is the next time that um, we're scheduled to have the, the police come and give us an update um, using our investigatory function, I've at requested that the police department present to us on the um, procedures and protocols surrounding the Jonas Korea arrest and uh, specifically to um, describe to us the level of force used and and um, explain to us the police conduct um, surrounding that incident and the usage of OC spray. And, um, and they'll be presenting to that to us so we can ask questions if we have any. And um, and and all the members of the public are invited. Thank Sorry, concert date, date and time again. September, <laughs> September 9th at five o'clock. September 9th. Yeah, that's the next. September 9th in in these chambers. Just clarification: the public's invited, but there, the public has comment a comment period, not an interlocutor. That's right. Period. It's not going to be interactive with the police. It, right. They, they, there's a public comment period. The public can come and attend. <coughs> after the public comment period, the public will will not be taking part in the meeting directly, interactively. That's keeping with the common, our common. Keeping with our rules, right. Thank you. Are there any other one minute announcements? Who will, who will? Um, Chief Sinkowitz will be there. Um, he, he's having, um, he's having, he's going to have someone else present, so I'm not entirely sure um, who, who else he's having present, but someone else who, who he's asked to come and familiarize us with the protocols. Okay. okay. Any other one minute announcements? I just really, I just want to announce the passing of Raymond W. Labarge's daughter, uh, Lynn Labarge Day. She passed away at 62 years old on Tuesday. And um, she's a friend of mine, and thank you. Thank you. Um, any other announcements? Okay. Um, yep, okay. We're going to move on to the Board of Public Works. Terry and Ed. Yeah, I've got my packet. Um, <coughs> This is um, do you petition. Think, I'm sorry. Just do you think we could do the licenses and reappointment? <laughs> sorry. Do that. You want to do licenses and reappointment first? That's the. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's go to that. This is for. Um, this is a Sunday license for four sorry. pool tables on the second floor and four pool tables on the third floor for Packards at 14 Masonic Street, Northampton. I move we grant the license. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of granting the license? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. This is a reappointment. Um, appointments to the committee uh, from Mayor David J. Narkowitz. Please find the attached appointments and reappointments to city boards and committees and commissions. Sandra Hellowell as a reappointment uh, to the Registrar of Voters. <coughs> Suspend Rule 30. Motion to suspend Rule 30. Second. Second. All those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. 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 Is there another motion? Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. All right. There's a petition for street acceptance uh, for King Avenue. And this is the planning board recommendate no recommendation April 11th uh, 2013, and the BPW recommendation was not ready. Um, I move that the council recognizes Director Huntley. Second. Second. It. Chairman Colt Kelhane. Kelhane. There's a motion and a second. Second. All those in favor of recognizing uh, Mr. Huntley Aye. and Aye. Mr. Aye. <coughs> All right, now you guys can come up. Just. <coughs> Those chairs don't get any softer, do they? <laughs> Chad can tell you that. <laughs> Chad, Chad's doing community service for some horrible, horrible thing he must have done. <laughs> 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 
Terry, thank you. Uh, good evening. Good evening. How are you? Uh, Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Chairman Colleen, is it, is it the case that uh, you do not want the council to uh, vote on the petition for <coughs> acceptance on King Avenue? I believe we our vote was that we didn't think it met. Oh, I'm sorry. If it says, if it says the recommendation's not ready. Oh. On our agenda. But if that's not the case, then, I mean, that sometimes the you, agenda. I'm caught a little bit by surprise. I thought we were talking about center court and. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm trying to help the council president pick off some easy, some easy things. If, if it's not, if King Avenue isn't ready, then we could just. Put it off anyway. the next meeting. Yeah. We've got so no problem deferring that if you, if that is your preference. It's not that it's not ready. They have work that they still have to do, but a petition was submitted to you. It's connected to the King Ave portion. Sorry. It's with your packet. A petition by residents of King Ave was submitted. Have we gotten a recommendation from the Board of Public Works regarding King Avenue? You have not. Okay. So as of this moment, um, we the initial vote was that we feel it does not meet minimal criteria to be recommended to you for acceptance as a public street. This process has been interesting, and I have to admit, as we work our way through the streets uh, in the number of some dozens now, you do think back to some of the earlier streets where we voted uh, along those same lines and think, well, maybe that should have gotten a yes vote. I mean, it, you know, you start looking at dozens of streets and it's such a hodgepodge. Uh, we've decided as a board that we're going to circle back to those streets that we essentially voted no to <coughs> and just review those votes once we've reached the end of the process. So they're um, going to be reconsidered. Council respect. Would that include the two tonight, Bradford and Center? Yes. So you would review those again at the We're going to review all of the ones that failed to garner support. So therefore tonight we maybe are not being asked to weigh in one way or another because you're going to come back and right. yeah, take this, another crack at it. Correct. Okay, thank you. And based on that I had asked Ned to hold on to those streets where we had that had failed to generate uh, sufficient support instead of forwarding them to you we're going to go back so can i have one more question so therefore it seems to me tonight what we're really looking at are just those that you have said we think these streets should be accepted so we have made and the recommendation that now you it comes to us you're recommending those and it's up to us to vote do we agree with that no. do we vote yes no, is that true no, sorry there's no record no, no, no okay. recommending to petitions them. for street acceptance a refer for re you want those referred I'm sorry yes. we're hoping that they'll get referred back to us because we have we have hearings okay. scheduled okay thank you I'm sorry oh, I mean, you, yeah I, I, I found this one kind of odd the King Avenue one it um, I know that twice in my lifetime that the city has <coughs> constructed the street totally. They installed a water main, sewer main. Uh, they ground it, removed all the material. They put new gravel in, regraded it, paved it. Uh, it looks like a city street. It looks like a, a city, city street. City street. It does. And I, I just found it. Warner and I, I spoke with um, uh, Mr. Huntley about it also, um, and it is exactly like Warner Row, as far as I can see. Which was accepted. So I, I, I don't know. I just I found this one absolutely odd. Uh, <coughs> Councilor Murphy and then Councilor Freeman. Just to follow up on Councilor Freeman Daniels, I'm I'm a little confused because we have disapproval of two streets. We have one that you're not ready, so theoretically we would postpone that one. But then you tell us, well. You're thinking now that you're through the process, you've learned more and you want to go start over again. So even the ones you've recommended disapproval on, mm -hmm. maybe you're going to change your mind. So maybe we shouldn't vote on anything <coughs> because you're going to start all over again. Could you clarify? There are I half a dozen streets out of the 40, approximately half a dozen streets out of the 40 that have failed to generate support. Yeah. 
we have decided that we'll, we'll circle back to those at the end of the process, which is coming up fairly soon. So but in the meantime, we probably shouldn't start the process right. of disapproving them only to have you come back and say, shucks, we changed our mind. Maybe we should just hold on what we do until you circle back and finish. That's right. It's just yes. yes. Did, did you want to respond to that, Terry, and then uh, Council I don't think that's unreasonable. I'm not sure that you need to do anything. I, I don't think. Well, they're already not streets, so. Exactly. Correct. <laughs> I just I just I'm not sure that it needs to do anything. We felt that we needed to explicitly say that we don't think the street makes the cut because of the plowing issue. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it implies, though, that you need to do anything further. And I, for one, appreciate the fact that you've learned, it's not a bad thing to have learned from the process and want to at yeah. least provide consistency and say, all right, we've learned something, let's give them all a look again based on our experience and our input. So I could certainly support that. So, okay, and, and the ones we're talking about, we're talking about a half a dozen, eight, yeah. seven or eight. Councilor Specter and then Councilor. So just for the sake of understanding what we're doing right now tonight, what I'm hearing is, what we would be doing is just voting to make the referral of these other streets under, under three. item three. That, that really is that would be terrific. That is the one thing you were asking us to actually do tonight those, is to move those, those residents have been notified by certified mail that we're going to have a hearing on their street. And it'd be great. Good. I'll move those as a group to be referred. I'll second that. Yes. Okay. Board. Motion. The, there's a motion on the floor. Uh, for to move item three <laughs> petition for street acceptance, I'll I'll name them: uh, Maple Avenue, Bratton Court, Franklin Court, Owaga Avenue, Carey Street, uh, Hebert Avenue, Greeley Avenue, Clark Street, Pine Valley Road extension, and those are to be referred to the Planning Board and the Board of Public Works. Councilor Freeman Daniels, on the motion. Yes, it's on the motion. Have has the board seen these streets prior? No. So these are new street acceptance hearings petitions. Pet first the petitions and now you'll schedule hearings correct so in fact we have taken the liberty of already scheduling them okay well, yeah that's okay but um the so so uh these all of these have been petitioned recently yes and they've we're receiving them we they haven't we haven't received them in the foreseeable past and we're going to, then the board will now have the hearing on. Right, and the planning board will have an opportunity okay. to make a recommendation. That's on, this is on the, mo on the on motion. motion. Yeah. Yep. Councilor Tacey on the motion. Yes. Um, I just intend to, to move these. Oh, they were moved. They're, they were moved. They were they were moved. on the floor and they're moved okay. to go. They were referred out. All the questions. <laughs> and uh, Councilor Murphy. Well, I just I, I just want to disclose that I'm not going to participate in this group because I own a property on Owaga Avenue. So okay. even, I just, even in the referral, uh, okay. that's a harmless one, but I don't want to participate in that one. In defense of the DP or Board of Public Works, this is a hugely complex issue and they're walking on eggshells as they walk, as they move <laughs> through this. And um, just, I intend to make an omelet over King Avenue. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So let it be noted that there will be an abstention from Council Murphy. Uh, <laughs> an omelet from uh, an omelet. I'm going to make it an right. egg McMuffin. <laughs> All right. Now we're getting punchy and we're getting okay. lost. Call in the, the question. And we're getting, so all those in favor of referring the items under under all the streets under item three. Move to refer. Please say aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions? Oh, well, yes. yes. <laughs> One abstention. Thank you. Got it. <coughs> Mr. President. Uh, Councilor <laughs> Freeman Daniels. Chairman Colleen, uh, you sat here for, you sat in the audience for three hours. Well, now four. Um, three and a half hours, um, and you, you just sat in the audience to ask us to refer these streets that we probably would have referred anyway. I, I'm not sure that. I don't think I don't think we're getting we're hearing the right thing from you. My understanding was that you wanted to talk about Bradford Street and Center Court. Okay, so all right, so these Bradford Street and Center Court <laughs> are not. The, the dozen are not within the so the so-called dozen that you're going to circle back to after they are they are yeah that's what he this is so, new so information that the board has the, the, uh, king so avenue for example 
I mean, we can see these in inconsistencies building up, and okay. so we want to go back to those streets. Can I, just to keep the floor here. Um, what I'm not understanding, though, just procedurally, is that uh, if, this, if the council votes to disapprove these petitions, I believe w wouldn't there have to be new petitions submitted for the board to accept them? Council's right. No, yeah, I, we're not going to. I think this is the question. So, so that we're. I think we're all getting tired. This is what I asked the only thing Terry we at the beginning. Referred. We're not going to be voting on these. Well, then why are we talking? About them? We're not. We're not. But he just said he wanted to talk. About yeah. It. No, no, he did he not. Thought, no, he, he did thought, not. He you, thought you, you said wanted to you talk. Thought you about wanted to talk about. You invited us. Me. I, my understanding you was I was invited here this evening to talk about these two streets. Exactly. And so far, we don't need to tonight. We don't need to tonight. So we've clarified. It's new news. We've decided to circle back and review the All right. So I think I'm sorry that you you waited for three hours to tell us that we didn't have to talk about this. All right. Well, for for clarity's sake now, then we've moved the streets and they've that have been referred. There's no sense in talking about items one and two at this point. You did also put in community service. It means you go to heaven faster than the rest of us. And that's it. So it was a fascinating meeting. <laughs> I appreciate your time, both of you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Now we're up to the approval. This is ridiculous. There, no, there's, they just came to represent a referral. Um, the, now we're coming. We're up to approval minutes. Move to approve. Second. Uh, thank you. Any discussion minutes? I don't think. All those in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, we're deferring the reports of committees. Now we're going to recess for finance. And I'm passing the gavel over to uh, oh. Councilor Murphy. Figuratively. No orders. Okay, figuratively. Yeah. figuratively. So, do we, um, <laughs> we need to call a roll. <laughs> We've got to call a roll. Here. Here. Yes. Here. Is refer the 2014 budget. So, would a member of finance wish to refer the FY14 budget? Move to refer. I second that. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone want to move to adjourn finance? I'll adjourn. To adjourn it. Second. Aye. 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 There's finance. Do you enjoy that? We're out of finance. Now we're back into the regular meeting. We're in a quick meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They do a whole lot better than me, clearly. <laughs> This is a uh, second reading upon the recommendation of the Department of Public Works. Uh, this is about the, I think we're going to have to wait for Council Dream Daniels. This is the drainage easement. Could we, could we move to number three? Yeah, we three. Three. Well, let's move to three, yes. Okay. We just lost Councilor Adams, so. <laughs> <laughs> They're dropping <laughs> like flies. You're we still be, have a quorum. Like all. <laughs> Mr. President, we still have, have a quorum. Well, we still have a quorum. Here's Councilor Freeman Daniels. Okay. <laughs> We're back, and uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels uh, just wanted to wait for you. This is the on the recommendation of the Board of Public Works. It's the easement for uh, the Bridge Street School drainage. Uh, so motion to second it. Second, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Uh, I want to um, thank the, uh, the council for. Um, uh, actually, I want to thank the Board of uh, the Department of Public Works and the City Central Services Department for. Uh, going out and having a meeting with the residents on Graves Avenue and um, giving them the, really the first look at the, uh, at the plans. And um, the, there are some issues about process that were rather concerning during this, uh, during this meeting, or actually during this, during this whole process, w one of which being that the easement were asked to accept um, when it came to the council, <coughs> it was already it had already been completed, and signed, and notarized, and uh, so it, it made it very difficult f if there were any changes that the that any councilor wanted to make, specifically me, it it was already it was done. It was already the, the ink had already dried for over a month. Um, it was also difficult for us to um, respond to many of the uh, Department of Public Works plans because it, they. They really weren't um, shown to, to <coughs> me and, and to the residents uh, beforehand. So um, after two weeks of scrambling around, um, I'd like to ask the council to uh, postpone this to the, to the set to the next <coughs> meeting because um, 
we we're working on um, some slightly amended language for the for the easement, and we're we're almost there. Uh, we have agreement in principle from uh, all the parties, but we don't actually have a new easement uh, with amended language with new language signed. So um, I I'm hoping that uh, if the council will uh, allow us uh, two two extra weeks uh, to complete a new easement that the the residents of Graves Avenue are much more comfortable with and the city is fine with and the owners are fine with that uh, we'll be able to have a, um, a more suitable uh, acceptance. Second. So I make it. Okay. okay. Second. So it's, uh, there's a motion and a second. Was motion, that, that was, was his motion. motion. I second it. Everyone wants to second that motion. So yeah. it's, <laughs> it's uh, the motion is to postpone to second. June 20th. Uh, the discussion of this easement. And can I also say just as can I make a comment that um, the construction scheduled for June 20th, like <coughs> 5th or 6th. So, but so there is time is important here, but we, I believe we will have everything done by then. So um, it would be your we, pleasure we to have two, two readings. readings. Well, no, this is the second reading. This is oh, the second, second, second reading. Sorry. Yep. Okay. Yep. okay. Thank you. That's aye. aye. All right. So aye. the all, yes, all those in favor of aye. Aye. you say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? <laughs> okay. <coughs> this is, uh, this is second reading for um, this is on the code of ordinance. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm starting to cave in here. Um, da, 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 this is the to establish the uh, elected officials compensation advisory board. This is Move second to approve. Reading. Second. Any discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And uh, well, I'm sorry. This is a roll call anyway, so we'll be able to register that. Name. Yes. 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 Nay. Yes. 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 Um, now what's left to me is to um, announce some. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I don't have to do that announcement. What's that? As we do this compensatory uh, comp compensation advisory board, yeah. never mind. <laughs> Remember, I forgot what they called it. Uh, uh, Alzheimer's? <laughs> Old <-time laughs> disease. I think it was called it. We were involved in something that was involved. The compensation. Compensation. Yeah. Uh, this is a salary charter. To, yeah, we had to create one. Yeah, but we had to come up with something. We had to take a vote before. We all had to acknowledge that we were part of it. No, right. That was only. That was, I, can't, I forgot what they called it. You can't think either. So you all got old timers. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> old timers. Um, why don't we, we vote of necessity? Uh, vote of necessity. Yeah, vote, vote of necessity. Need, yes. That, too, that right? was it. Floor Adams remembered it. Uh, I don't think we got five minutes. We're going to do this. This is. Uh, I'm going to announce some public hearings. Um, uh, but are there any committee chairs who want to have an update? How about the number four? Are we not doing that tonight? No, we're not. No. no. Okay, thank That's you. Been at thank the you. city thank solicitors you. asked okay. to have that removed. Are there any committee chairs that have any update? All right. The, this is an announcement of the City Council FY2014 budget hearing with the city departments. And as we said, it's the school department, <coughs> the uh, uh, legal department, arts council, uh, dispatch. Library. And Forbes Library, and that uh, that will be Tuesday, June 11th, from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. God willing. Okay. Uh, the the others uh, on Thursday, June 20th, uh, 2013, at 7:05 p.m. This is a, a public hearing regarding the Department of Public Works at 125, uh, uh, 125 Locust Street, an application for license for storage of fuel. Uh, and then also an announcement for a public hearing on Thursday, June 20th, 2013 at 7, 10 p.m. This is regarding the Department of Public Works, 33 Hockenham Road. And it's an application for a license <laughs> for storage of okay. fuel. God, there's two hearings on that. And then, and then June 20th, also 2013, this is regarding petition for poll and wire locations uh, on Haydenville Road. And that will be here. They're all here. They're all here. So, 
uh, any new business referred for topics that uh, the chair did not reasonably anticipate would could be discussed. The, is there Council Murphy? Yeah, I, do have Murphy. Something. I do have one, and it's a quickie. Um, if you all recall, uh, Middle Street parking we tabled. Yes. And um, it still remains an issue, so I'd like to request that we take it off the table. I was going to suggest at our next meeting, but that agenda is pretty deep. That's the, we will be doing all the orders, all the, all the budgetary orders. Yeah. So um, I was going to suggest our next meeting, and I cannot make the 27th, so put it off the table for our first meeting in July, or our, our only meeting in July. Only meeting. So I would move July just because it's so busy till we get to July. Second. Aye. Seconded. All those Aye. in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, because I didn't, I didn't want to invite them all to come unless we, <coughs> I could tell them. That's a July, July so a motion 11th. To adjourn. Move to adjourn, okay. Second. All those in favor? Is that July, July 11th? Yeah, it's the only meeting. Why not? Bush made up all June. Right? Two minutes before. <laughs> July 11th, it's the only meeting. It's our only meeting. Right? Yeah, that's good. You paid off the fault DPW to start it.